Hello, everybody, I think. Let's see if everyone can hear me properly. <laughs> That's always the uh, the good thing to start with. Can everybody hear me? And can you see me? Am I alive? Are any of us really alive, or are we just in a giant simulation? How are we doing, everybody? <laughs> Watching the chat, waiting for the chat to catch up. Ah, excellent. I have heard the first yes. Right, okay. So, welcome back to the uh, live dry, uh, dry Docs. Apologies for the... Oh, YouTube. Um, apologies for the rather large delay. I did want to get to doing, you know, two of them a month starting in December, but, well, a lot of life events t uh, turned around and said no, illnesses, other sorts of things. So, anyway, without uh, getting into too much detail on those, we're going to try again to catch up. Obviously, later this week I'll be heading over to the States, so it won't be a live stream for the next couple of weeks. But when I was going through the live stream questions, I noticed I had alternate history questions from Drydocs 261 and 266. Individually, not massive numbers compared to what we've had in, on previous occasions. So I thought, well, combine them. That means we do actually have 32 alternate history questions to get through, but some of them should be able to be done relatively quickly. So I'm hoping we'll run a similar schedule to what we have before. So probably take an hour to an hour and a half getting through the alternate history questions from Patreon. Then obviously we'll catch up with the super chats and then get into general public questions um, after all of that until it's time for me to go to sleep. And yeah, I do have the iron brew. So hopefully my voice will be spared long enough. Right. The first question comes from, uh, my name is Guybrush Threepwood and I am a mighty pirate. Now that's an old reference. I remember playing those games. He asks, if you could go back in time to 1750 with all of your knowledge, but without the manufacturing capability, what would be the most impact you could have? Okay, 1750... I think the single largest impact I personally could have as an engineer and historian would probably be my knowledge of the Seppings and Simmons ad, um, construction advances that occurred in the beginning of the 19th century, sort of 1810s onwards, because that allows you to use, I wouldn't necessarily say inferior timber, but shorter timber pieces, the kind of timber pieces that might be discarded in the 1750s to build stronger and larger vessels than was heretofore possible or you could build similar size vessels still stronger and cheaper so in 1750 if i'm basically kick-starting that by 60 70 years from a current engineering standpoint it's actually not that difficult to do but it would allow, obviously, if I'm being sent back in time from where I am now, I'd end up in the UK. So it would allow the Royal Navy to either have insanely strong, tough ships built very quickly and cheaply for the time period, or the Royal Navy could get a head start on 120, 130, 140 gunships of the line well before anyone else does or physically can, which... Either of those would make a huge get, uh, game changer for the Royal Navy in its various combats with, well, practically everybody at that point. Um, because, you know, by, by the mid, middle of the 1700s, things like cures for scurvy and working out longitude and latitude, they're all pretty much either done or nearly done. So advancing those slightly isn't going to help all that much. Knowledge of things, how to make gun cotton, well, that would also mean having to completely rework the metallurgy of the period so you have guns capable of using it. And, you know, all, all of that kind of thing, it's it's a tools to make the tools to make the tools to make the machines to make the improvements kind of situation. Whereas just sh sitting down with people and going, look, here's a bunch of wood you used to throw away. Here's how you can use it to make better ships. That in and of itself will be a huge game changer. Uh, Christoph Goebel asks, if the US Navy had been magically given all the knowledge, tactics, doctrine, etc., and technology, such as torpedoes, of the Kriegsmarine on December 8th, 1941, 
how much more effective would their submarine campaign have been and would this have shortened the Pacific War significantly? So essentially at that point you're getting the U-boat operational experience up till 1941. On the one hand that would eliminate some of the more questionable tactics that US subs tried in the early part of the war. On the other hand a great deal of Kriegsmarine U-boat experience is how to deal with an enemy that has a lot of fairly advanced anti-submarine escorts which is not really applicable to 1942 Japan. Um, but the torpedoes, certainly, working torpedoes would be obviously a huge, pro uh, huge problem for the Japanese, huge benefit for the US. Now, this kind of question does crop up occasionally. I think at some point I'm going to have to do a Fun Friday video. Well, I, I know I'm going to have to do a Fun Friday video on what exactly the impact of a working Mark 14 would have been. The problem with that is that it involves identifying every single US submarine that went out on patrol in the Pacific in, well, from December 8th, 1941 through to when the fixed Mark 14 started to be issued, then going through their torpedo expenditure tables. Now, fortunately, the vast majority of the war reports from the various patrols that the US subs did, they actually filled in little cards that it counted for each torpedo, what they'd shot it at, what the result of that was, whether it was a miss, early detonation, a hit, a dud, or whatever. But that's still a lot of work because there's an awful lot of war patrols that are done in the year and a half it took them to fix the Mark 14. And then once you've done that, tabulated it all, and then worked out, okay, but the, the, so you've got two problems. One is ships or subs that never made it back. So obviously they didn't get a chance to fill in their war reports. We're never going to be entirely sure what they shot at. But secondly, of course, you've got issues you know, with submarines expending most of their torpedoes at a single target. If they hit with their first few torpedoes and send them to the bottom, then that sub in theory has almost another couple of dozen torpedoes to go off and attack other ships with. We don't know what other ships they would have attacked because in real life they didn't have the torpedoes to do so. So even then it would be a it would be a, a table with a lot of holes in it, but it could at least give some idea of how well they would do. Would it have shortened the Pacific War significantly? It, it depends on exactly how you envisage each engagement going because there were some engagements against some fairly major Japanese warships or troop convoys where the impact of successful torpedo strikes may well have changed the course of that campaign, but whether it would have changed the course of that campaign enough to shorten the war, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult thing because it's the beginning of the war. You know, if you sink three or four Japanese troop transports where historically they weren't. That's a lot of Japanese soldiers going down to the bottom. But at this point, Japan has almost uncontested dominion in the early months of the war over the Western Pacific, at which point they could just send in more men. So, you know, it's delaying the campaign, but it's not ultimately changing the fact the Japanese will take whatever island they were heading for, at which point it's not really going to change the Pacific War all that much. Because bear in mind, there were a lot of islands that were just bypassed. There were lots of Japanese troops there that surrendered at the end, very end of the war. But it is a bit of work that I am slowly, you know, trawling my way through. And hopefully, eventually, I will be able to give you a more definitive answer than I don't know, but I'm still looking. <laughs> Lord Nelson asks. Ooh, if you're teleported through time and space to the city of Carthage in 262 BC, your goal is to improve the Carthaginian navy as much as possible to get rid of the pesky Roman ships. Um, but in the beginning, you can neither write nor speak Punic, right? So probably going to end up sacrificed or something. Um, warning them about elaborate Roman schemes is therefore out of the question. For the time being, you are limited to the things you can demonstrate to them in person. How can you help the Carthaginians the most? If I'm trying to get the Carthaginians to win that round of the Punic Wars, but I can't speak the language, I just have to show them and presumably they have to you know, trust me enough. 
I think probably the best thing I could do by pantomime would either maybe be showing them my version of Greek fire and getting them to stick it on little catapults or something on their ships, because then that obviates the whole, you know, boarding thing. Uh, just set the enemy ship on fire. Other than that, because of course that requires the ingredients and well i don't know what the well yeah i don't know what the carthaginian for quick lime is nor do i know what the carthaginian for um things like nap that well actually that they might understand but uh, pine resin or similar they're probably i'm probably going to have problems with that um what else could i show them I'm not entirely sure at that at that stage without with the language barrier in place I think that just you know that or or like drawing maps drawing uh drawing diagrams of battles in on the ground or something that might work but then of course with that with using the future knowledge of how battles went etc the problem is if you switch one battle to being a Carthaginian victory then everything else you know domino effect is no your knowledge is no longer particularly a, a, applicable but yeah but i mean broadly speaking they're they're probably not going to trust me um and there is also the slight possibility that if i start calling you know generating massive fireballs and everything they may think i'm some kind of magician or well they might either think i'm a magician in which case they might you know decide best gotten rid of or they might think i'm a demigod in which case well, slightly better for me, but very awkward to try and keep that up. <laughs> King Brock asks, If the high seas fleet is not scuttled and Germany keeps a few ships, the rest are divided amongst the victorious powers, which ships does each power want and how would this affect the interwar years? Would there be a Washington Treaty? Yes, there would still be a Washington Treaty of some form, because the Washington Treaty is to limit the expansion of various fleets. Germany, if it gets to keep a few ships, is pretty much going to get saddled with the ones it has historically. Um, or maybe they might allow them to keep the Nassau's out of spite. Um, maybe the Helgelands as well, because it's... or some mixture thereof, because the... You know, everyone acknowledges by... 1918 1919 that the 12 inch armed capital ships are pretty much second rate if not going out of service already the that's slightly different with the battle cruisers because they still have quite useful speed now which ship does each power want well the British are not really going to want ships to include in their own fleet they have more than enough of them the British are going to be looking at it from a perspective of, okay, what do we say we want to keep them from other people getting their hands on them? Which is pretty much what the British were trying to think of at the time the High Seas Fleet scuttled, and why, whilst they were a little bit annoyed at the sneakiness of it, the British weren't exactly heartbroken that the High Seas Fleet had scuttled themselves. I think... See, the British will definitely want the battle cruisers especially the newer ones the so Deflinger and Hindenburg they'll want them kept out of everybody else's hands so they'll be going after those and similarly with Bayern and Baden the French will probably want stuff to supplement their own battle line I mean the French did get some cruisers and destroyers out of Germany at the end of World War One, which they did keep operation for quite some time um and to be fair, the Kaisers and Koenigs aren't that bad, so France might be going for one or the other of those classes. The Americans by this point are well into the standards, so they're not going to want any of the German 12-inch capital ships, so France can have free run at those. I think the US will either will probably definitely want some of the more modern German cruisers, because the US is quite deficient in modern cruisers at the end of World War One. And they'll probably be tussling with the British over who gets to get to, to get the their hands on German battle cruisers because 
you know, free battle cruiser, why not? Um, I don't think the Americans will want Bayern and Baden particularly because again they have the standards and the the Bardens don't fit into that. Um, destroyer wise most most of the German destroyers are quite small so again the French maybe the Italians would have first crack and pretty much they'd be the only things anyone cares about and U-boats well U-boats would be distributed as they were historically because there weren't all that many U-boats at Scapa it was the battle fleet. Um, then we have alternate historian Turtle Duck. If the bullet that hit Admiral Kimmel killed him during the attack on Pearl Harbor, would he still have been made the scapegoat for the disaster, or would people at the time and later historians um, have a more favourable view of him? Um, I think he would still probably be the one that they pin everything on because if there's one thing that's easier than pinning you know if there's a disaster the one thing that's easier for than pinning the blame on a living but disgraced admiral is pinning it on a dead admiral who can't answer back so yeah he's probably still going to be made the scapegoat but possibly because he you know dies heroically in action he may not get quite the same level of vitriol poured at him as he did at the time and in the immediate post World War Two histories. Um, you know, there, there's that whole that whole thing. Is it from Sharp or something like that? I can't remember from the top of my head. One of the Napoleonic TV series that came out in Britain a while ago. Um, you know, and is often memed. There's that whole Major Lennox answered with his life, sir, uh, as so should you if you had any honour left. And that is the you know, if Kimmel it dies in action at Pearl Harbor, then you know there's the whole to a certain extent don't speak ill of the dead, but um, court martials do like assigning blame to the dead. But if he seemed to go down in a blaze of glory in action. It might they they he might be then characterized as he made mistakes, but overall it wasn't that bad as opposed to what he got, you know, historically. Architect 096. Um <laughs> So this is a bit of a convoluted long alternate history, so I'm just going to summarize it. So essentially, um, in 1921, it's an alternate timeline. Poland has managed to somehow establish a stable government and find a big stash of cash. Um, the Polish Navy consists of a few ex-German ships, but has next to no naval infrastructure. Um, some experienced naval personnel drawn from various cadres of previous occupying powers and do, do, do. we have a stable but not unlimited budget and we've been ordered to prepare Poland for future war against two possible enemies Soviet Russia and the Weimar Republic um, how would you design and procure a, such a Polish Navy um, and apparently we're told we're also in the early 1930s going to get twin engine bombers that can be equipped with torpedoes okay so if I'm preparing a defensive navy to defend Poland against attacks from either the Soviet Navy or the Germans. Yeah, having next to no naval infrastructure, which you know, fair enough is what historically what Poland was left with, is going to be a bit of a problem. But I think my broad approach is probably actually going to be similar to the Swedish naval, uh, naval approach with a few minor differences. So I'm probably going to have two or three major fortresses built on land uh, to defend key ports. And obviously I'm going to put a lot of investment into naval infrastructure. I want I would want my shipyards to be able to, by the early to early mid 1930s, to be able to build at least cruiser scale vessels. Um, sorry, I am a little bit tired. Um, and whilst I am building my infrastructure, I will probably order a flotilla of destroyers 
and start working up some kind of design for a coastal defense ship inspired by but not exactly the same as the Sverige. So you might remember that when the Germans were considering the Deutschland class, they they in, ended up going with a long distance commerce raiding cruiser option, but they did have a similar tonnage heavily armored coastal defense ship option. Um, and at that point, I would basically just be going the other way for the heavily armored coastal defense ship option. So if I've got, let's say, three naval fortresses, I would be looking at three coastal heavy armored coastal defense mini battleships, I guess you could call them. And then once my destroyer production is up and running, I would I would basically be doing similar to what the Japanese would, were doing, which would be to order, let's say, four ships from a foreign yard and build and build the other eight in my new yards, which would then allow me to get experience in building destroyers and obviously gradually move over to building and developing my own ships. Uh, so the first flotilla that I ordered by the mid to late 1930s is going to become a, the training unit. But I think what I would be aiming to do would be to have a flotilla assigned to each coastal defense ship, which is in turn is assigned to be backed up by each fortress. The destroyers would have to have mine laying capability as well, because they would, I'd want them to surge out and emergency deploy mines to defend my little pockets of resistance. And then you can work, you know, the rule of thirds. You may, you know, one of your fortresses is not going to have a battle, a coastal defense battleship available at any one point, but you can sub in from other places depending on what's more threatened and your destroyer flotillas if you've got say a dozen destroyers you can have four on duty four getting ready or going into refit and four offline and you can surge eight maybe more if you hold off on the maintenance if tensions are rising that gives you uh, three fairly good you know organic self-defense units and then as time goes on as i get into the 1930s I would then also be assigning torpedo bomber squadrons to the air, to cover the the various areas as you know backup and potentially also looking at building a trio of cruisers fairly fast cruisers I don't think I'd be looking at building particularly large ones but essentially not necessarily an Atlanta style vessel but something that's covered with a lot of fast firing guns and is primarily aimed at being a gigantic destroyer leader. Um, and then building, as I say, at least three of them on the basis that uh, each of my flotillas now has a fast leader to follow them around, and that will help defend against other enemy destroyers. The coast defense battleship obviously going to be relatively slow, but their high speed also means that, you know, if I've got my, again, hypothetically three fortresses, if an attack comes in from Germany, my cruiser that's furthest to the east can skedaddle and reinforce my fortress in the west and likewise if the soviets come from the east i can very rapidly reinforce my my fleet coming by sending the, the westernmost ships over that i think would be the the upper limit so by the late 1930s i've got three coast defense battleships three fast light cruisers and three destroyer flotillas backed up by squadrons of torpedo bombers. And the destroyers themselves would be, you know, following on with, you know, Bliskovica and Grom, etc., would be fairly large, capable, multi role vessels capable of mine laying, as well as fleet attack and so forth. Entrovert asks The Battle of Trafalgar occurs as it did historically, right up until Nelson is shot. Boo Centaur is a charnel house, but she and Red Tabla somehow manage to isolate and capture victory before help arrives. You're in Collingwood's place on Royal Sovereign. You know from visual evidence that victory has been taken, but you have no idea whether Nelson is alive or dead on board. The initial plan is going well, but your commander is likely out of action. Other captains are looking to you for guidance. What are your orders? Um, okay, so... I mean, <laughs> at the time that Nelson is shot, it's very difficult to construct a scenario in which victory is taken. I mean, yes, Redoutable is still locked in with victory, and Redoutable it does have quite a vicious um, 
crew trained for boarding. But by the time Nelson is shot, Temeraire is already on the other side of Redoutable. So we would have to hypothesize that Temeraire has not done that and is perhaps wandered off elsewhere into the battle and is therefore distracted. Now, if victory is somehow taken in that manner, well, as, as yet, the plan otherwise was going relatively well. So Collingwood's line would continue to do what it's doing. And to be honest, they can't really do anything else. But what Collingwood would probably signal is that, you know, given the density of ships in that melee that was nearby Victory anyway, Collingwood would almost certainly immediately signal both the ships that were in the immediate vicinity and the ships that were at that point, you know, still just coming into action to all concentrate on demolishing Redoutable and Bucentaur and retaking Victory. Because they, a lot of them do have those kinds of options. Um, because, you know, they, they might be engaged in a firefight with a French or a Spanish ship, but they do have enough gun crew that they can man the guns on the disengaged side to basically pelt the French ships with even more fire than they historically received. And between the casualties that the French crews would have sustained fighting victory and capturing victory, plus being under fire from every nearby British vessel, then when a big three-decker like, say, Britannia, which is quite far back in the line, rocks up, then Britannia shouldn't face too many problems in just pulling up on the other side of Redoutable, raking the deck with grape shot and boarding, and then continuing on to basically release victory from French borders. So I think that would be my plan. It, basically, it would be a, an annoying interruption, and I'm sure it would give the French Navy something to talk about forevermore in the, in the annals of the history of Trafalgar. But given where victory was, and you know the fact the entire line is piling up around her in terms of the Nelson's column, she would be retaken in relatively short order should Collingwood actually signal to them that they need to do that. Um, Edward Franklin Woods asks, <laughs> suppose you oh this is a okay this is a modern-ish one but i'm going to allow it because it's not strictly about warships um he says suppose you were given an unlimited budget to create hospital ships what would go into your design and what would you need to adjust <laughs> when the bursar realizes he's probably put too many of it, uh, zeros on your check okay so if i'm designing a modern hospital ship and i have an unlimited budget um okay th th there's actually no i was gonna say there's two ways of going about it but actually no technically technically there are okay one way of going about creating the ultimate hospital ship would actually be very similar to the way I believe it's the Comfort, the US Navy's one of the US Navy's hospital ships was done, which is basically to take a gigantic cargo ship, at which point you basically just got a big hollow box on, on the water, which essentially offers you unlimited conversion potential. Now, that that to a certain extent is relatively boring because it's essentially you know I, I forget what the exact designation for the comfort is it's like you us something something s comfort um but you know it's essentially just that but better um because they can get a newer ship and a bigger one the other way which i personally would probably do and which you know, may or may not be a potential uh, candidate, I think, for the replacement of RFA Argus, for the Royal Navy, would actually be to rock up... Oh, there you go, Eric Knapp, US, USNS, USNS Comfort and Mercy, there you go. Um, so I would just go to the Italians and go, that, that Trieste class that you've got there, can we order one, please? Because it's a big, fast 
hybrid between an LHD, LPD, and, and a small aircraft carrier. Um, and the reason I say that is because you've then you've got this nice big hangar bay, and um, but you've also got the ability to bring in ships and uh, through the I think the well deck, but you've also got a nice big flight deck. And then I would bring in a technology set which I've seen at the Navy Leaders Conference last year which is essentially, if you like, modular hospitals. So they're, ba they're built into either into um, standard great shipping containers or into containers that are basically the same size. But they're essentially like self-contained operating rooms, treatment rooms, ward rooms, triage rooms, etc. And the idea is you can just crane them on and off and you can use them to set up entire hospitals. And of course, you know, as long as you connect your services, your uh, water electricity etc they'll just run because obviously they they already have shelter roofing etc and the reason i would do that is because you can then just fill the hangar deck with them and then if you need to show up and you need to rapidly transit casualties well you have a huge flight deck you can get loads of helicopters going to and from you can depending on how, and because obviously they're all modular, you can determine for the particular nature of the tragedy that you're going to try and relieve, you can determine how many of these hospital models you need. So if you need to take helicopters with you, and it's maybe not quite as major uh, a problem as some of other things might be, you can have a few helicopters stored in your hangar deck. If it's a sort of standard thing, you can have a few helicopters stored on on the uh, flight deck and have the whole hangar deck converted into a big hospital and if it's a really major thing you know like i don't know some kind of natural disaster maybe vesuvius decides to cook off again or something like that um then you can actually just strap even more hospital units probably your waiting rooms and triage rooms to be perfectly honest partially on the flight deck and you, then you can have mass transit by helicopter in any circumstance and you can get heavy lift stuff coming in via your well deck. So, you know, ambulances potentially taking smaller hospital units ashore to help out with that. Um, and again, also mass casualty movement because helicopters, there's quite a lot involved in flight operations and they can only bring us so many people. Whereas if you've got a few landing craft stashed away, um, then you can, you can mass move 100, 200 people at a time. So, and, and I suppose the last thing would be then if you've arrived at a at an area that has is experiencing natural disaster, but still has some kind of intact port facility somehow with a crane, um, you could drop off your entire hospital module component to the area in need. They now have a full-fledged field hospital and you can leave, you know, some vehicles and helicopters behind, etc., with the staff. And you can just go back and get another whole hospital and bring that with you again. Um, so that would be, you know, my ultimate unlimited budget option. <laughs> um, the main, the main reason I I would use the Trieste setup is because you've got that. Multi, that flexibility of heavy, sm well, small scale, but heavy, effect effectively amphibious shipping capability, plus mass air movement contingents, plus the whole thing is designed to be able to move large objects to and from the flight deck, which means that if you're using this modular hospital idea, then you can refit, resize as needed. Obviously, if you're going to build a dedicated hospital ship, that's another matter entirely, but... <laughs> You said no budget, so I'm going with, with the ultimate budget. <laughs> Ash the Lego guy asks, um, aside from the lack of the morale boost dash morale blow for the respective sides, if Admiral Yamamoto was not intercepted by the P-38s, what would, in your opinion, have historically changed from that point on? What strategic war planning between 43 and 45 was changed because of his leadership replacement and how much of his directives were carried on as he had set it? I, d I don't know that a huge amount would have changed. There, there may have been, I think the, part of the problem is by the time Yamamoto is killed, there is 
the, the Japanese Navy is massively on the defensive. The US Navy is colossally on the rise, almost regardless of who you, you put in charge of the Japanese Navy at that stage, they're on a, you know, they're on a hiding to nothing. The two things that I think might change at that point would be one, Yamamoto is a lot more decisive and has a lot more of a grip on the upper echelons of the Japanese Navy than some of his successors. So some of the dithering and arguing that characterizes mid to late war Japanese naval operations may not happen, which is good for the Japanese, not so good for the Americans. On the other hand, the you know a lot of Yamamoto schemes were incredibly complex, which was often their downfall, and trying to pull off increasingly complex plans with progressively fewer resources. Whilst obviously thinking you know, things like the Battle of Leyte Gulf show that they are that is not l limited to Yamamoto, it probably would continue as a, as a major problem. The, the the second big change I think that would happen as a result of that would. It would probably be, given that Yamamoto is very, very keen on aviation, he would probably be against the Kamikaze program, but he would probably also have a more realistic view of Japan's naval air strength. So some of the kind of throwing good, good pilots after bad depletion of the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Corps in the latter part of the war might not happen, but that's again it's not going to massively change things but it might make things a little more difficult in the interwar period sorry in the mid-war period uh, for some of the battles where japan still had carriers vaguely loaded with a reasonable amount of aircraft um you know that they might be better trained there might be slightly better tactics going on but not it's not going to change that much um so sort of Babylon, actually, a ba good Babylon Five quote for that would, you know, is 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 Kosh when he uh, first Kosh, obviously, because they are all Kosh. Um, but when um, when he says, you know, the avalanche has already started, it's too late for the pebbles to vote. That's basically the situation anyone who's in charge of the combined fleet is going to be facing at that stage. There is precious little that they are going to be able to do that's manifestly going to change the course of the campaign. Um, Nick Broda asks, if Hitler rises to Roosevelt's provocations in 1940, i.e. the neutrality patrols, destroyers for bases, deal, etc., and declares war on the US, does this materially change the Battle of the Atlantic? And do the Japanese follow suit? Uh, no, in 1940, the Japanese don't particularly want to have a war with America at that point. They're quite happy beating up the Chinese. So they would kind of just look at it and go, okay, that's cool. Um, let us know. Let us know how that goes. We're we're going to keep on over here, uh, apart from anything else. You know, they're in the middle of introducing a lot of the stuff that we'd become very familiar with in the historic Pacific War. Then it's probably the single worst time for them to actually choose to declare war. Um, but does it materially change the Battle of the Atlantic? Um, yes, yes, it probably does, because it means that the U.S. is going to be building um, escorts a lot sooner. Um, something you're going to find out in a couple, I think, two, 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 two and a half weeks' time, when we're covering one of the earliest U.S. destroyer escort classes, is that. The U.S. had been arguing, U.S. Navy had been arguing back and forth internally about the wisdom or capability at all to build some kind of destroyer escort, as it would turn out to be. And this scenario basically circumvents that. You know, we need something now. We're going to have to start building something now. So U.S. production of small um convoy escort craft is going to be starting earlier plus of course the existing u.s destroyer fleet is going to be employed earlier as will u.s navy patrol aircraft now of course we know what the historical introduction of the u.s into the battle of the atlantic was you know some parts went well other parts 
didn't go quite so well, but they picked up on experience relatively quickly. And in this case, we're just moving everything back, what, a year and a half or so, which essentially means the U-boats have to deal with the other big Navy coming after them for a year and a half longer than they did historically. And of course, assuming that Japan follows roughly the same pattern that it did historically in terms of when it declares war on the US, you're looking at a scenario where the US is able to dedicate, not necessarily all, but a, a, a bigger portion of its Navy than it did historically to the Battle of the Atlantic, which is just going to make the Germans even you know, more sad. <laughs> Jim, so just if you're keeping track, we're about one third of the way through the Patreon alternate history questions at this stage, which means we're roughly on track, I think. Um, Jim Smitty asks, assuming World War One doesn't happen, what directions do you see naval technology and design going with, given the experience of the Great War? hasn't occurred. Like, what odd or fun rabbit holes does naval tech and ship design go to without the need to bash the other guy in the head with high explosives? So ships are probably just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The interesting thing is, of course, that the the Germans, you know, historically we say they dropped out of the naval arms race in 1912, which is pretty much true because they never got around to building anything more in substantial numbers. But Without the war, there will be obviously a period where the German army will be taking a bunch of money. But when the Germans eventually get back around to building things like the Mackensons, we we know that the Germans were aiming for sort of bringing together the battleship and the battle cruiser into a sort of fast battleship. Um, and they were perhaps a little bit ahead of the curve on that thinking compared to everybody else. The Americans are probably going to just keep plugging away with standards because without a war, there's no massive impetus for Congress to not do that in terms of funding. Um, now, of course, you may get a more expansionist US, which authorizes, you know, lots and lots of ships later on, which, you know, like they did historically. However, it's going to be a lot harder to justify if there's not a major war on, which potentially might compromise US security overseas. Congress might just turn around and say, yes, you, you want a lot of ships, we understand that, but also we're not paying for them. The British, well, they will, I mean, we won't get renowned and repulse. Uh, it be interesting to see what battle cruiser they come up with that stands or will then sit between Tiger and Hood, because they will eventually build Hood or something like Hood in response to the Mackinsons when they hear about them, um, let alone the Ersatz Yorks. We will get eight Revenge class, and we'll get to finally see what uh, Agincourt, the the sixth Queen Elizabeth, was going to look like. That'll be an interesting, interesting thing. So ships like the... I think the thing is, we, once the Mackinsons and maybe even the Germans start building the L-20E Alphas, in the last part of the 1910s, the British are going to be sitting there, probably sitting on a fairly large contingent of 15-inch armed ships. The 12-inch armed ships might actually start to be retired sooner than they were historically, because you know if you've got whatever, let's call it for the sake of argument, Leopard, continuing the cat theme, plus six QEs, plus eight Revenge class, I mean, you're looking at 15 15 inch armed ships not including the admiral class um and then you've got a dozen 13.5 inch armed battleships the, the 12 inch ships are probably going to end up going into reserve in the latter part of the 1910s at which point by the time you get to say 1918 1919 People are going to have moved on to not quite the G3s and N3s and so forth, but certainly ships that wouldn't be a million miles away from them. So because you don't have that big interruption of the First World War in battleship construction terms, you, you're essentially dragging, I think, capital ship development forward three or four years. Um. 
Um, Jim, uh, no, that is the one I just did. Oh yeah, the other things, aircraft carriers not going to be invented, well, as quite as soon. They're going to be more curiosities because the massive, excuse me, the massive pace of advance in aircraft development that occurs in World War One, you know, there's not going to be quite the impetus for it or the operational experience to prove the point. So the aircraft carrier is going to be more of a curiosity. Be interesting to see where destroyer development goes actually as well. Um, whether they head off to being very, very large, almost small cruisers by the end of the 1920s, or if they stay at the smaller size. Marlin Stout asks, it's well known that the Army's Opana Point radar station picked up the incoming Japanese plane shortly before the Pearl Harbor raid, but contact was dismissed because a flight of B-17s was supposed to be arriving around that time. What effect might it have had if the contact port report had been passed along to General Short? Do you think Short would have called an alert and launched fighters? And if so, what effect would that have had on the Japanese attack? And by extension, what effect would that have had on the rest of the war? If the Japanese lose more planes and pilots at Pearl Harbor, does the US Navy do better at Coral Sea and Midway? Um, if it's, I mean, I don't know a huge amount about the temperament of General Short, so I'm just going to go with, if he's told there is an unknown, there's a bunch of contacts coming in and they're not B-17s, he's probably going to launch fighters to investigate. The, the problem is going to be how many fighters can he get up and how experienced are those pilots? Because the Japanese have a lot of zeros coming in with a lot of combat experience. And unlike, roughly speaking, when the historical launching of land-based fighters was accomplished, the zeros are still going to be in escort formation around the bombers, which is kind of what they're there for. So... Given the likely number of fighters the U.S. will be able to get off the ground in time, and given the problems the U.S. has with coordinating fighters once they're up in the air, I, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference because the Zeros will be basically perfectly placed to just take them head on. So, you know, there may be a, a slightly reduced amount of strafing by Zeros going on because they're dealing with the US fighters. There may be one or two or several more than that additional Japanese dive bombers and torpedo bombers shot down uh, in that initial pass or maybe with, uh, you know, flights that are managing to hook around and dive in. But unfortunately, the you know, given the timing involved and the positioning of those zeros in escort, I don't think it's going to massively affect the overall outcome of Pearl Harbor, unless, of course, by sheer happenstance, one of the P-40s manages to down the Kate that actually, you know, destroys USS Arizona or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's going to hugely affect things for Pearl Harbor generally and therefore you know not really for Coral Sea or Midway either. If you want an effective opposition to the Pearl Harbor raid, you need to have essentially the whole base coming up to alert status at the time that that radar contact is passed through. So uh, yeah, the quote unquote just launching some US AAF fighters to go and see what's going on I don't think is enough. Um, if you had some kind of, you know, warning that maybe something was going to happen, so lots of aircraft were ready for hot takeoff, and then they all launch when the alert is sounded, that's another matter. Um, but if we just go with the radar alert is taken seriously and some P-40s are launched, yeah, no, not not massively. Graham William Kidd asks, if the Royal Australian Navy purchased three carriers in time so that they are commissioned, worked up and fully operational by summer 1939, what nation's carriers do you think they buy and of what class? And what would their aircraft fit out be in 39, 43 and 45? Do you see the Royal Australian Navy having any unique modifications? <laughs> Take a guess at their service history and how they'd alter the war. Okay, so 
I don't know, maybe Australia found that gold reef that's supposed to be floating off mysteriously in the desert somewhere there. Um, given that this is... To, to get them commissioned, worked up, and fully operational by August 39, that means you're going to have to start ordering them in early... Nine, in the you know before 1935 the early part of the 1930s that means the australians are definitely ordering from the uk because it's pre-world war ii australia they're ordering basically everything from the uk and given that time window the early 30s where they need to order it they are essentially buying three more arc royals um so <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's actually a relatively easy one. They're they're buying the the three sister ships to Ark Royal, and also it makes sense because Ark Royal is designed for the Pacific Theater. <laughs> what would their aircraft fit out be in thirty nine, forty three, and forty five? It's going to be broadly similar in well in thirty nine. It's basically going to be the same as what the fleet air arm has because you know again. They're mostly going to be buying British stuff, um, so that they'll they'll order the planes at really right now. Excuse me, put my teeth back in. They'll order the planes at pretty much the same time the fleet air arm is ordering them, and I'm sure you know fairy makers of the swordfish etc. will be very happy with with that idea. Um, I'm semi tempted to say they won't have the rock or the skewer because they are looking at a slightly different operational environment. If the Royal Australian Navy is having carriers, they are looking at fighting the Japanese. The Japanese do have aircraft carriers. So the sort of the fleet air arm general principle of fighting in waters where they're not so much expecting to come across large amounts of fighters at sea, because obviously Italy and Germany lack aircraft carriers. They... It's possible the Australians might push ha harder for some of the single-engined, uh, single-seater fighter concepts of the late 1930s to be brought to the fore, so they might have those instead. Um, but by 43 and 45, certainly, both from the just the logistics of the matter and Britain's aircraft factories being heavily overstretched, I think by... Certainly by 45, they're going to be rocking Hellcats, Corsairs and Avengers, etc. Just for ease of operational interoperability with the US. 43, then, the US is still, you know, really heavily trying to fit out its own carriers in 43. Because you've got the Wildcat to Hellcat conversion going on. You've got Essexes coming online. Um, on the other hand, the US was able to sell Wildcats to uh, to the UK, uh, where they were martlets. So I think maybe in 43, in 43, you might, I think you're definitely going to have US fighters aboard, probably martlets. For strike, I, it will depend on how many Avengers the US can crank out. Um, for strike, you might still have either albacores or maybe early barracudas. But if the US is building enough Avengers, you might have those as well. Um, take a best guess at their service history. Now, that's the... I mean, they can't get a massively alter the war. If you've got three Ark Royal-type fleet carriers sitting in the southwest Pacific... That is not a threat the Japanese can afford to ignore. Um, so, I mean, it depends where, where they go, really, because three Pacific-oriented Ark Royals, you are going to want the Kido Butai to try and deal with them, but are the Australians going to surge them forward on their own to try and take on the Kido Butai? Probably not. Do they get allocated to ABDA command? Mm, no, I don't think so. The interesting thing, though, would be that if the Australians have at least a couple of them operational, because, um, I mean, they're all fully operational, but, you know, maybe in refit or something, um, one of them might be in refit. But if you've got a couple of Ark Royal-style carriers 
available to you in the Southwest Pacific, 4Z is not going to be sailing without aircraft carrier cover. You know, 4Z will wait, or maybe the Royal Australian Navy will be asked to redeploy one of their carriers to Singapore to support 4Z, which means that 4Z almost certainly survives because, yeah, 41 turning 42, that's going to be martlet time. I mean, you look at Somerville's uh, ships dr during Operation C. And yes, there's a mixture of Sea Hurricanes, uh, Full Mars, and Martlets, but he does have the Martlets. Um, and they are actually the single most numerous fighter type on, in um, Somerville's forces. So if you've got a mostly Martlet equipped Australian carrier supporting for said, and you know, they've got radar to spot this incoming unescorted strike group of uh, twin engine G3Ms and G4Ms, yeah, for said surviving that one, and the Australian carrier is going to rack up a fair number of interesting kills. The problem, of course, with that is it throws the entire paradigm of the Southwest Pacific campaign out of whack for the the you know the early part of 1942. Because instead of having to go, oh yes, well the British they're hiding off in the Indian Ocean, we can deal with you know attacking the Dutch and the Americans and continuing our advance that way, and then maybe we'll go after them with the Indian Ocean raid later. If you've got Repulse, Prince of Wales, one or two Amer uh, Australian carriers, and potentially a bunch of more other British ships rocking up as well, that's a fairly major threat axis developing in the Southwest Pacific that the Japanese cannot afford to ignore. But also, the Japanese can't turn their full attention to dealing with that because then you've got the Americans from the other direction. Now, of course, the other interesting thing is that some of the Australian Navy ships were present at Coral Sea trying to, uh, well, helping to escort the Lexington and Yorktown. So if you've got maybe one Australian carrier sitting with Prince of Wales and Repulse initially trying to help hold Singapore and then later holding the line in the Indian Ocean, because let's face it, it's not going to really change all that much about the fall of Singapore. Um you potentially could have one or two Australian carriers sailing, perhaps with 4Z, to join up with the American forces going out after Coral Sea. And with the, an additional carrier hull or two, plus more fighters, plus more escort, plus, of course, Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy fighter direction, Coral Sea might turn into a tactical as well as a strategic victory for the Allies. Now, I don't know, think there's going to be enough strike options on those carriers to probably take out any more Japanese ships than were historically taken out. But the thing is, at that point, you're basically adding a, an additional available carrier hull or two to every future battle after that. I mean, of course, Japanese subs and carrier aircraft will be gunning for the Australian carriers as well. So there is a possibility one or more of them might be sunk, but we don't know if dash when that's going to happen. And ultimately, there are three of them. So, you know, adding, adding an extra carrier hull or two at Coral Sea, adding an extra carrier hull or two at Midway. Um, given the experience of Victorious with Saratoga and the, you know, the difference in fighter control and direction, and given the historic problems we know that the U.S. Navy was having even by Guadalcanal, I can even potentially see the Americans offering to, you know, shift a few more wildcats the Australians way and essentially telling the the Australian carrier look can you act as the fleet defense carrier so you have this thing launching 50 60 70 plus you know maybe fit between 50 and 70 martlets dash wildcats in 1942 at probably not Coral Sea because that'll be where they learn the lesson but maybe at Midway and that forming a very well-directed fighter umbrella over the U.S. ships, which in turn allows the U.S. ships to devote more of their own aircraft to going forward and attacking the Japanese. And that will probably extend into Eastern Solomons and Santa Cruz and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that's... That is a fascinating possibility. I mean, quite how the peg for it, I don't know, but you know, I think I think you got your money's worth out of that one. Um, Patrick Donnelly asks, had 
USS Enterprise CV-6 not been damaged on 14th of May 45 and been with Task Force 38 when the Japanese surrendered, what are the chances of her being picked as a ship as the ship for the surrender ceremony over USS Missouri? And if not, would she have had a special role or honor to acknowledge her service in the Pacific War? Now, I did answer a question very similar to this in one of the recorded dry docks. And essentially, whilst yes, if Enterprise is there, then by all rights, she should be the ship that the surrender is signed upon. The flip side is that, you know, Truman has a lot of connections to Missouri and is going to be pushing very hard for Missouri to be the ship. And so that's probably going to be the, the ship that takes the, the surrender anyway, because there were a couple of Pearl Harbor survivors in, you know, there anyway and uh, at the surrender and they weren't picked. Um, Missouri was instead. Some of the some of the objections, you know, limited space, etc., are more than addressed by Enterprise's massive flight deck. But I, I would only give her maybe 30, 35% odds of being the ship that has the Japanese surrender on them because of you know because of Truman's love of the Missouri. Although, you know, if she did have the surrender take place on her um, let's say the you know the various admirals ganged up and just told Truman, no, we are having it on Enterprise, and he actually allowed it. Um, that might increase the chances of Enterprise becoming a museum ship. Cringe Pog asks, uh, where are we in questions? Oh wow, we got a few to get through. Okay, Cringe Pog asks. We're about halfway through, by the way. Um, if somehow, through magic means of it being available a few years earlier, the, would the Japanese building more Akazuki-class destroyers and generally replacing their old 5-inch guns with the new 100 mil guns have appreciably extended the war, or would it have only taken more Allied pilots with them? Probably only just... It would have just meant more Allied pilots go down, uh, because ultimately... You know, numbers of Japanese destroyers involved in anti-aircraft escort and, I mean, just looking at destroyers generally as anti-aircraft escorts. Um, without radar, this is the, I think this is, I think ultimately what it comes down to is that without radar controlled fighter direction, which is what you get from, um, with, with the US, etc. in the, mid to late war, the utility of the heavy anti-aircraft gun, i.e. you know the dual purpose gun, is still somewhat limited. I mean if you look at the 5 inch 25, 5 and 5 inch 38 record in 1942, it's okay, but the vast majority of the killing is being done by the 20 mils and the you know the few 40 mils that are arriving in theatre at that point. The effectiveness and lethality of the five-inch gun massively jumps when radar-directed fire control is brought into play, and massively jumps again when uh, the proximity fuse is brought into play. So, bearing in mind that the Japanese will not really get either of those, they certainly won't get the proximity fuse, and they don't get radar, certainly not anti-aircraft gunnery control radar, particularly in the Second World War, they do get other types of radar, the more basic ones, you know, having that 100 mil gun, it, it is going to knock out a lot more Allied aircraft than the 5 inch did, but not enough to manifestly change things. It's basically just going to mean fewer aircraft come back from otherwise broadly successful missions as compared to, you know, just broadly successful missions occurring. Um, Reva asks, what's your understanding of just what happened to the Mary Celeste and why? Um, again, something that's come up in a few previous dry docks, there, there's just not enough information to go on. Um, I think the only thing that I would probably say with any degree of certainty is that something whether that be a water spout or leaking alcohol fumes or you know some other thing something disturbed the crew very quickly and i'm partial to the idea that they you know they 
got into a ship's boat that was supposed to be tied to the ship and then turned out not to be tied to the ship. Um, I someone you know someone failed to tie it on or tied it poorly or whatever, and you know they got left behind and the ship sailed on without them. What exactly it was that spooked them, I I don't know, um, but it was certainly something that you know prompted them to urgently all drop what they were doing and leave the ship in some way, shape, or form. Um, Yeah, I think that's probably the only thing that that's about as far as I could go with what is actually known about the the ship itself. Um, if John Plate asks, sorry, John Plate asks, um, if there is no European theater of World War Two, Japan is still going to attack on roughly the same timeline. Yeah, pretty much. Otherwise, I run out of oil. How would the French Navy look? in this scenario okay so france is still intact no war in europe and japan attacks so obviously we're looking at you know things like french french indochina in late 41 early 42 i mean peacetime france late 41 the the richelieu is going to be online jean bar may be online joffre certainly is not going to be um, I think it's going to be a matter of how much warning are they going to get of increasing tensions. Because if they do get a fair bit of warning that there's you know tensions with Japan going up and up and up, I can see the French deploying an expedition, a naval expeditionary force to try and counter Japanese offensives. Although if they are in any way, shape or form sane they're going to ally with other people in the area because that you know they're not going to be able to do it on their own um if they don't get any warning at all bear in mind that france historically even pre-war doesn't have a huge presence in the pacific then it probably doesn't change too much at the beginning because well whatever's there gets overrun pretty quickly but without a European theatre, then when you get not for said, i.e. the British, well, because no European theatre, so the British can also deploy a fleet to the to the Indian Ocean and then into the Southwest Pacific. So the big fleet build up, you know, 10 battleships, four carriers, etc. the British were looking at doing, the French will probably tack on to that. Um, what they'll send again probably Richelieu their better modern cruisers and destroyers because they need the range apart from anything else um possibly send a backup contingent of some of the Britannias and some of their older ships for like second line escort duties etc but I don't think they'll be sticking them in the front line Uh, the Freaker 86 asks, I know it's a kind of unusual way to pose the question, this question, uh, but how's it going with the book about Bismarck that I translated for you? Oh yeah, this this one. So sorry for taking so long to get to this. So the Freaker 86 very kindly found a German book that has not been published in English about Bismarck and actually translated a good chunk of it for me. Um, it has been very, very useful and I ha I wouldn't say that any part of it has gone has completely flipped my understanding of Bismarck upside down entirely, but it has helped inform in a lot more detail um, a future video because yes, of course, I, there will be at least one other more video uh, on Bismarck that um, that I am going to be doing in the future. So I don't know when it's going to happen, but well, there are two videos on Bismarck which I'm planning on doing at some point in the future one of which will look into the evidence for and against the scuttling argument uh, but the which uh, i would say this book didn't really add a huge amount to my understanding of that but the other one where i want to actually you know because i've you know everyone knows i call bismarck an inefficient design but at some point i do actually want to go through and explain in detail exactly why i say that so you know go through Bismarck's all the Bismarck's major systems so fire control guns turrets um magazine arrangements machinery armor armor layout etc and essentially go look for 
for what she is, this part of Bismarck's design is good, bad, indifferent. You know, basically a strengths and weaknesses type video so that people can then more fully understand, you know, if I say Bismarck overall is an inefficient ship, this is why. This is uh, These are the major areas for improvement and these are the uh, areas where it actually is, it's all right. Um, Saga of Irrelevance, or Sage of Irrelevance even, asks... Um, so I'm just reading it's a fairly long question. Um, okay, so he, his question is basically, I get put in charge of the Royal Navy August 1st, 1929. With effect, effectively an unlimited budget and current historical and engineering knowledge. So what do I do? Do I go with the First and Second London Naval Treaties? Um, what do I get built? So, okay. Brief edited highlights. Yes, I'm still going to stick with First London. Um, I will stick in name with Second London. But given that I have future knowledge... I don't think I'm going to be arguing for the reduction in caliber, or if I do argue for a reduction in caliber, it'll be from 15 to, uh, sorry, from 16 to 15 inches, because I am definitely getting that new 15 inch 45 caliber gun designed. The King George V will have three triple 15 inch turrets of the brand new 15 inch gun design. Because if I've got essentially an unlimited budget, not only am I designing that, but I'm also just, you know, opening up the print run on those guns. So as the as the guns are manufactured, obviously they will be going on the new King George V, but I will also be retrofitting them onto every 15-inch ship I can get my hands on. <laughs> because the as proposed 15-inch 45 was actually slightly lighter than the 15-inch 42 and was going to be compatible with the old shells so i can get the best kinds of shells you know the best 15 inch shells from a higher performance gun immediate increase in lethality across the board for the vast majority of the royal navy's capital fleet um what else am i doing uh you know and with, with to be honest with three triple 15s the escalator clause i'm not going to be particularly heartbroken about not getting a 16 inch armed ship in there um, I will, however, probably, um, uh, yeah, minor detail with King George V, getting rid of that fire dead ahead across the bow thing, getting them proper clipper bows, and preparing quietly off the side Vanguard design, Vanguard designs ahead of time as well, um, so that I can basically stick single Vanguards onto all of my yearly capital ship orders. Um, what else am I doing? Capital ship wise, I think that for the 30s, that's probably the capital ship building I'm going to be doing. The refits, well, I'm already refitting everybody with new guns if I can. Um, Hood is definitely getting her refit. Obviously, Warspite is as well. Um, Renowning QE. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to even bother with a 5.25 to be honest. I'm just going to go, you know, Arc Royals already got the 4.5. I'm going to make the 4.5 inch gun essentially the british version of the five inch 38 it's going to be the ubiquitous main armament for all my new destroyers it's going to be the secondary armament for all my new and retrofitted capital ships it's going to be the anti-aircraft armament for my aircraft carriers it's going to be anti-aircraft armament for my cruisers etc 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 um the only problem that leaves me with is that the the didos are probably looking at being slightly undergunned um but i could always just take one of the the k series designs or the k25 series designs oh yes actually dido class is in not to the dido class it's going to be the k25 version that has a triple stack of twin guns at the back and a quadruple stack of twin guns at the front 
So I have seven super firing twin 4.5s because at that point, it doesn't matter that they're 4.5s. That's what, 14 barrels pointing at you? Yeah, that, that's going to hurt. Um, aircraft carriers. Well, I've got budget, so um, I think I'm going to keep the armored flight decks, actually. So I'm going to basically go with a hybrid approach similar to Midway and Malta, etc. at the end of the war. So I'm going to keep my armored flight decks, but I'm not going to have the fully armored sides forming a box girder, which is going to allow me to have bigger hangers, taller hangers. I'm definitely having tall hangers, 17 and a half foot minimum height hangers, but please thank you very much. And hey, I've got the I've got the budget for it, so why not? Um, so you know, a aircraft carrier probably operating 60 to 70 aircraft. Imagine a a slightly enlarged Arc Royal design with a single large hangar deck and an armored flight deck. Um, what else can we look at? Say so that's carriers, that's capital ships, cruisers. Um, I'm not going to build York and Exeter. I'm just going to go with either more counties or a revised future version with three triple eights. Uh, cr light cruisers, um, the towns are fine. Let's keep going with that. Um, yeah, if, if anything, yeah, actually just keep going with the towns. Towns with 4.5 inch secondary AAs, um, maybe accelerate the construction of because i know that second london is going to collapse so maybe accelerate so that more towns are built to belfast and edinburgh standards and keep building those destroyers um you know again everyone's got 4.5 inch guns tribals come in i'm um, probably around the same time and then after the tribals, because then that gives me my gun destroyers. Everyone else is just going to be six 4.5 inch, you know, two twin forwards, one twin aft, um, two quintuple torpedo launchers. Everybody's happy. Build, crank out as many of those things as possible. Um, submarines, I think, are probably, apart from just building more, so more of them, I think are probably fine. Um, don't worry, Sean Riley, you will still get Exeter. It'll just have more guns. <laughs> um, or alternatively, if people really, 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 really let me, you know, let me have my way with things, everything's, well, not everything, the destroyers, not so much, but maybe at least the uh, heavy cruisers and capital ships are going to be all forward designs, <laughs> just because I like that. Um... Oh, Duke of Petchington actually brings up a good point. Commonality of hull. Considering it's a 10,000 ton cruiser, which is your treaty cruiser. Um, and yes, because I know the second London's going to collapse. I'm not going to go with the 8,000 ton crown colony. That's actually a really good idea. Come up with a, a common 10,000 ton cruiser hull, which can take either twin eights or triple sixes. And then I just build as many hulls as I possibly want and just go, right, you're a heavy cruiser because you've got twin eights and you're a light cruiser because you've got triple sixes. Solves a multiplicity of problems. Commonality of parts. <laughs> Animal 16365 says, don't forget to invest in 4.5 inch auto loaders. Yeah, I mean, yeah, auto loading will be very, very useful. But to be honest, in the, in the scope of the 1930s, I think, you know, bringing auto loading forward to that point is probably just being a little bit over ambitious um wisdom in the shadows <laughs> asks if hms victory HMS Ajax and HMS Agamemnon, supported by the original six American frigates. So you're talking about three ships of the line, including one first rate, plus six heavy frigates. Well, three very heavy frigates and three heavy-ish frigates. Are thrown into a running into the running battle of the Spanish Armada. How effective were they against the older Spanish ships? And how will the battle change based on when they join the overall action? 
Um, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so if three big Royal Navy ships of the line plus three 24 pounder frigates and three 18 pounder frigates rock up to the Battle of the Spanish Arm, uh, to the Spanish Armada, the Spanish Armada is going to massively regret them showing up. Because bear in mind, the Spanish, when they were you know, in the channel, they had some of the biggest ships in the world, and they had the biggest ships there quite easily. But the, as you would have seen in that bit, that video, the notable thing about them was that they are over a thousand tons. Victory's a lot more than a thousand tons. And, you know, whilst various Spanish ships did have 40, 50, 60 guns, you're talking about relatively slow firing guns and a mix where relatively few of them are anti-shipping guns. And a lot more of them are small and medium caliber anti-personnel weapons. If you're talking about, you know, several hundred 12, 24, and 32 pounders showing up with a rate of fire measured in, you know, multiple salvos every 10 minutes, plus the frigates, they're just going to rip into the Spanish. I mean, they've got the, they've also got the speed, the agility, and the size to be able to essentially just operate in, uh, as their own squadron. So if Drake um, and Effingham, etc., have their head screwed on right, then I suspect they're probably just, in fact, actually with, because the frigates, although Victory is faster than most of the frigates in really rough weather, there's not really a huge amount of rough weather in the channel. So the frigates will be actually faster and more agile, still have a lot of firepower. The three ships of the line will be slower, but also have a lot of firepower. So at that point, the English fleet is best served by just clumping all together, keeping the Spanish tension, have the ships of the line head up the left flank of the Spanish eye between the Spanish and the English coast, have the frigates run out into the deep water in the channel where they can use their maneuverability to best effect, and then just basically have them pincer their way and basically eat their way through the two wings of the Spanish fleet because they have more than enough firepower to cripple, dash, destroy vast number amounts of Spanish shipping. And then once they've crushed the two outer wings, then you have a three-way pincer movement on the Spanish core. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, referring to the previous question about me being in charge of the Royal Navy, um, Sean Quigley asked, no money into speeding up development of gun laying radar and anti-sub weapons? You could, you could do, but I, you know, similar to the auto-loading thing, a lot of that is, technologically speaking, just a very late 1930s, early 1940s thing, and throwing money at it is not going to have... I mean, it will have an effect, but it's going to have a relatively limited effect. Um, whereas what I'm trying to do with with my idea is essentially create the ultimate platforms upon which, because I've only got a 10 year term, upon which my, whoever my successor is taking up in 39 has a lot of freedom to do, to, to, to run with. So when radar starts to become a really big thing in 39, 40, 41, the Royal Navy's got a huge bunt load of really useful ships to stick the radar on. <laughs> okay, we're now two thirds of the way through the alternate history questions. Um, Graham W. Kidd, uh, uh, I'm just going to quickly answer this super chat because it is relevant. Graham W. Kidd says, can we please have a 24 hour warning for live segments? I would have loved to have listened to the first half, maybe put out a tweet or something. Um, yeah, I can definitely try and do that. Um, I can, well, the general principle of giving a little bit more, a little bit wider spread warning, yes, definitely fine. Um, I, I will take that on board. Um, the only caveat to that is that, you know, well, at least this side of the trip to the US, when I'm, when, when I can sit down and go, yes, I'm definitely able to do this uh, live stream, you know, I didn't really know I was going to be able to do that until about halfway through this morning. Um, 
But hopefully in the future, yeah, there will be a lot more warning. Um, and yeah, the show will be available after the end of the broadcast. It'll just go in the live stream section. Um, Lord Nelson asks, uh, are, miraculously, somehow, Spain remains neutral during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars and even reforms enough to make its colonies reasonably happy. Okay, now we are talking about divided intervention. Uh, not to mention that simply being at peace already drastically boosts its economy. Well, yeah, trucking lots of gold back and forth, etc. Um, how would such a strength in Spain have fared against an emerging US navally? So if we're assuming that Spain doesn't have its fleet somewhat trashed and its economy trashed by the Napoleonic Wars and somehow is still keeping South America vaguely on side. I mean, given the evolution of colonial empires from 1805 to 1900-ish and how they change and how, you know, how they interact with their home nations, it's, I think it's impossible to say definitively how well it, everything would go. I mean, obviously the Spanish would have more ships and better equipped ships and probably better trained ships as well. They probably have a lot more of ships in South in the Caribbean as well, because if they've got a lot more South American holdings to defend, then they've got more reason to have ships based over there. Um, the, the the problem is it's it's one of these things that with a century long gap, an awful lot of things can happen in that gap. I mean, you know, how they're keeping what will eventually become all the South American countries on side, barring of course Brazil, which is Portuguese. Um, that in and of itself is a little bit of a mind boggler. But assuming that they somehow do, if you have a relatively large colonial empire sitting into the immediate south of you that means the us cannot be as isolationist as it was historically for most of the 19th century which in turn means that whilst the spanish navy will be bigger and better equipped and probably more experienced the us will almost certainly have been forced to have a larger navy and you know, therefore a better equipped Navy uh, with more experience relatively consistently throughout the 19th century, simply to address the fact that there's, you know, the most of the Spanish Empire sitting on their doorstep. At which point, you know, who's built up how much Navy to what scale and when is a hugely open question. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I could give a realistic definitive answer there because you you could have a situation where let's say that spain has just modernized its navy so maybe you know they had central battery ironclads and they held on to those for the 1880s late 1870s 1880s and then in the 1890s they went you know what we we've missed a generation here and the spanish navy at the time of the spanish american war has just refitted with modern armored cruisers modern pre-dreadnoughts at uh, which point they have the numbers and the firepower to deal with the US Navy quite easily. Conversely, uh, and, and you know, assuming that the US Navy has kind of continuously been building ships, so it has a few pre-dreadnoughts, but also a few late ironclads and a few earlier ironclads and so on and so forth. The, conversely, of course, Spain might have done its big modernization push in the early 1880s. So they've got kind of... Um, Ben Bow era late ironclads as the majority of their force and only a few modern ships and the US Navy has maybe just just done its modernization in the early 1890s so they're the ones with modern armored cruisers and pre-dreadnoughts and so forth so yeah um, unfortunately I can't give a better answer than that but it maybe gives you some idea of the the paradigms involved you know, a century of complete alternate history is really too much to give any definitive forecast for. Um, Telemonian Dan, if the Royal Navy does plan and carry out a successful torpedo airstrike against the high seas fleet at Wilhelmshaven, how do you think it would change the perception of carriers as primary strike weapons and the development of future carrier construction, design, tactics and air group complement? Well, I can immediately see the massive argument breaking out about between sort of people who want to carry carriers forward and people who want to not do that. 
the, the one of the biggest arguments is going to be, but would it work with ships at sea? You know, the high seas fleet at Wilhelmshaven in 1918 would have been a relatively speaking sitting duck with minimal, you know, minimal anti-aircraft defenses, no fighter defenses, not underway. Uh, by that point, they've taken the torpedo nets off most of the ships. It, you know, people will be arguing it's pretty much the ideal target. Whereas in the future, ships at anchor will have land-based anti-aircraft guns, more ship-based anti-aircraft guns, potentially their own fighters, land-based fighter es uh, escorts. Um, but there definitely will be torpedo nets in harbour now, etc., etc. And if the fleet's at sea, then you've got the fact the targets are moving. So those would be a lot of arguments would be being had. But the idea of a carrier, I don't think carrier as a primary strike weapon would gain a huge amount of traction, but as a strike weapon rather than a supporting element, that would definitely get traction. The other thing, of course, is that the proposed strike on Wilhelmshaven involved 120 torpedo bombers. And if that's been relatively successful, bear in mind there will still be a, a certain amount of misses and duds and so forth, then people are going to be looking at that as kind of your roughly minimal threshold to success, which means that if you're going to be building an aircraft carrier fleet with a view to putting 100 plus torpedo bombers over a target, and now you've got to deal with enemy fighters, which means you need your own fighters and so on and so forth. That's probably going to push carriers to being considerably larger vessels as a general rule than historically. Because obviously historically you get the really big stuff like a Kargi, Karga, Lexington and Saratoga. But it very rapidly trends downwards in terms of overall displacement. Whereas if you're looking at a situation where people going well we need to be able to field two to three hundred aircraft in a strike to ensure we get enough torpedo bombers that survive over the target that means it's probably more economical to have three or four carriers that can operate 80 to 100 aircraft than it is to have eight or nine carriers that can only operate 30 to 40 apiece um So yeah, that 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 would be a there'd be a lot of arguments in the 1920s. I would say that Marcus Danielson says, "Hey Jack, just got a recipe book for 45 classic meals of the Swedish Navy. Would you like if I translated and sent some to you?" Yes, very much yes. Um, although uh, if you want to see me eat any of them, the ones that have more meat and carbs and less vegetation in it would be the, the ones you want to start with. <laughs> uh, Andre de Kult asks. Um, Ah, uh, <coughs> excuse me. That's um. Andre there's asking in detail the sequence of maneuvers for a ship of the line to come about. Um, that I've actually put aside as a. Uh, from uh, as a fun Friday video to do at some point. So uh, apart from anything, I don't have the drawings ready. So <laughs> there you go. Um, Sapper Ninja asks, at the commissioning ceremony of HMS Dreadnought, there's a lightning storm and a blinding flash of light, and suddenly the crew find themselves sitting on HMS Vanguard of uh, you know mid-1940s, at the time of her commissioning, ship is at full combat load, has a full set of technical documents and operating manuals, but no historical information or context for the design choices. What do the 1906 Royal Navy make of the design of Vanguard? What can they learn and replicate and what confuses them? And what are they unable to recreate due to the technology level? Um, okay, so let's do, let's do our very basic speed protection firepower triangle speed um propulsion is there anything the royal navy can replicate from the propulsion not exactly but vanguard is running at slightly higher pressure and is oil fired so those are two big clues that these are the things you need to go for in the future 
And of course, Vanguard's operating small tube boilers. So the idea that you need small tube, higher pressure oil fired boilers, that in and of itself is quite useful. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that they'd be immediately able to replicate Vanguard's machinery, although probably wouldn't take them too long. But, you know, being able to halfway house it to get the, you know, the late 1900s version of small tube oil fired boilers would definitely be within the remit of, of things they could do. Also, uh, the transom stern would be quite useful to to know about and the elevated flared bow. Those would be quite useful. And of course, the general hull design. There's you know another couple of few decades worth of hydrodynamic design in that. So broadly speaking, yeah, they can get some fairly useful information out of that. Um, protection. I don't think they've got the level of metallurgical analysis to be able to you know take scrapings off of the hull armor and work out what the improved recipes are. But just seeing that protection on that scale is possible. I mean, it's not thickness wise is not hugely more the all or nothing layout, though. That might prove quite useful to know about. That might prompt a slightly earlier shift in that particular uh, design aspect. And then firepower. So the 15 inch gun is not massively far off. The 15 inch 42 that Vanguard has is not massively far off what the technology of Dreadnought's period is capable of. And I mean, historically, obviously, the 15 inch 42 is only about half a decade away at that point. So mildly accelerating the development of the 15-inch gun is not exactly shocking. Um, the shell design, on the other hand, both the overall design and the uh, actual working fuse, those will be very helpful for the Royal Navy. Um, the 5.25-inch turreted battery, in and of itself, I don't think will confuse them that much once they realise that, yes, you only have eight guns, but they're basically free of all spray. Uh, eight guns per broadside, that is. And they're free, but they're free of all spray and have a fairly large tracking element. You know, the idea of turreted secondaries is not unknown to them at this point. So they'll be like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, all the anti-aircraft gun barrels and the 5.25 inch high elevation, that's going to confuse them a lot, at least until they find the fire control directors and the fire control tables that will talk about anti-aircraft fire. They'll probably wonder what, what it is in whichever time Vanguard's come from that makes aircraft such a threat, considering the state of aircraft in 1906. Um, and that's probably something, therefore, they won't replicate immediately. But, so I think, the, yeah, the 40 mils will probably end up being landed quite quickly, I would imagine. Um, although having the, you know, both as 40 mil in 1906, I'm sure they can find other interesting uses for it. Um, they're not going to be able to replicate it in full, immediately, as I said, but kick-starting the development of the British capital ship as a fast, heavily armoured, 15-inch armed vessel is probably not a more than a few years away. What, then, what they're not going to understand quite as much and not really be able to recreate due to the technology level of 1906 will be the obvious elephant in the room, the radar. You know, the principles they can probably understand but the actual replication of radar, given how cutting edge it was in the late 1930s, yeah, that's, and especially, of course, Vanguard's radar is mostly a couple of generations advanced beyond the initial stuff. The, it'll probably take them a few years to work out exactly how the radar works in the first place, and then actually being able to even put together a very, very crude radar set is, you know, that's years and years and years away. Uh, unfortunately, Vanguard doesn't have any onboard aircraft, so they won't be able to take any lessons from that. Electric lighting and ventilation, however, I'm sure the crew will like that. Um, Asuria Sky asks, Operation Tengo runs under the cover of a typhoon that prevents airstrikes. The Iowas are sent out to sink Yamato. Due to the extraordinary confluence of circumstances, 
USS New Jersey is separated from the other battleships, and both her and Yamato have their radar disabled by the storm. In the darkness, while travelling at the best speed each of them can manage, the two battleships collide and separate. No shots are fired. What are the best circumstances in terms of angle of impact, timing, elevation due to waves, etc., for each ship to win a World of Warships-style diehard flag, in which the ship is more likely to have the best chance to survive the impact and related damage, provided the storm abates and dissipates over the time after the collision? Okay, so basically... Uh, so for ultimate for the best chance of survival for either ship the 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 best chance is a bow on impact so you want to hit with your bow um because your bow is relatively long and especially in the hours code it's long and thin um you're not losing a huge amount of buoyancy if it gets crushed like a tin can which it will be um and ultimately you can just stop and back up Ideally, obviously, you want to hit your enemy broadside on. Now, in terms of where you want to hit your enemy, that's another matter. Hmm. Just mentally going over the layout of both ships. Do, 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 do. Okay, if it's Yamato that's doing the ramming, I think you probably want to hit just fractionally forward of the first main battery turret on New Jersey. And let's say if you're hitting from the starboard side, you want to hit at an angle where you're coming towards, so instead of perfect T-bone, you want to be coming in at maybe an angle of 10 to 15 degrees. Um, so how would you describe it? Uh, basically, you want to have your bow pointing 10 to 15 degrees back um, along towards the, the uh, midships portion of New Jersey. The idea ba basically being you want to try and crumple in not quite i don't think you're going to quite get to the point of shearing off the bow but you essentially want to go for almost a bow shearing effect crumpling in the absolute outer frontmost end of the armor belt whilst also massively compromising the uh longer lateral armor bulkhead that's just forward of the magazines and because you're that you're relatively not massively but relatively far forward on the hull you've also got less of the torpedo defense system to work your way through and the idea of that is that by you you've compromised the citadel of the new jersey and the ship is because you are at a slight angle you're going to get a semi glancing motion which means water is going to pour in and it's probably not going to that that's probably the closest you're going to get to a single impact being able to do devastating damage to New Jersey with Yamato surviving. If you flip things on it their head and it's now New Jersey doing the ramming against Yamato, um, then I would probably actually go for the point. I would try and ram actually again point pointing slightly aft from perpendicular but I would probably try and ram roughly abreast the aft 18 inch gun because at that point you're going to be shattering prop shaft connections um, potentially compromising the aft 18 inch magazine although I'm not necessarily sure I'd hold my breath on that but the general point is that for Yamato Yamato is so much wider and generally larger because she's you know almost a 70,000 ton battleship that apart from the damage it will incur from you know broken propeller shafts whizzing around all over the place there's so much uh, there's so much volume aft on Yamato that if you punch that hole right at the aft end of the citadel 
the the sheer amount of flooding as well as the crippling of the propulsion system is almost certainly going to doom the ship especially because of course you'll get a lot um a lot of the flooding on on the one side so the idea would be to try and get yamato to get hauled over and capsized by the, all the weight that quickly and the reason why i didn't suggest yamato doing that to new jersey is simply because new jersey is being a somewhat longer thinner vessel there is proportionally slightly less buoyancy for new jersey to lose there and new jersey's propulsion system with you know the skegs and the unit machinery etc is just ever so slightly better able to cope with that kind of impact so it's a similar kind of impact but just two slightly different locations the problem is in theory you know in if just looking at the internal layout in theory a direct hit amidships is best or slightly forward or aft because of amidships because then you're compromising the machinery spaces the larger spaces on the ship and the magazines the problem with that is it means you're also punching straight into the main armor belt and the thickest portion of the torpedo defense systems which means the whichever ship is being hit has the maximum opportunity to mitigate your impact whereas if you hit just outside or on the edge of the citadel you're maximizing the damage that your own hull is able to do um Oh yeah. Weird question, but fun to think about. Um, <laughs> of course, if you want to go with real, like absolutely terrible Typhoon Cobra style weather states, there is also the rather hilarious image of New Jersey, say, riding in a slightly rogue Typhoon strength wave and just dropping her bow you know elbow wrestling elbow drop style as a, like a giant knife blade just in front of yamato's bridge just smashing through that triple six inch turret and just effectively guillotining the front off of yamato neatly getting rid of the uh, negative buoyancy issues that the iowas have by leaving her bow embedded in yamato and then just reversing off laughing um October Nid asks, uh, what is the highest tier upgrade that could conceivably be slapped on a majestic type pre-dreadnought battleship if we throw, throw all sense to the wind? Radar? Yeah, you could have that. Uh, 50 cal guns? You could have 12 inch 50s on a majestic. Probably only the front two, but whatever. Float planes? Yeah, take off the aft gun, aft turret and stick a float plane launcher on there. Automatic 12 inch? Probably not. Phalanx CRWS, there's plenty of six inch down the side. Yeah, you could probably put that on. Um, what's the highest hit upgrade that you can conceivably slap on a Majestic Type 3 Dreadnought Battleship, though? Probably nuclear missiles, actually. I mean, mad as it might sound, I think if you, yeah, if you were going to do all sense to the wind, if you pulled the turrets off of a Majestic class, you could probably fit at least one ICBM in each of the 12 inch barbettes, replace the magazines and everything, turn it into some weird kind of minimal capacity arsenal ship. <laughs> um, Architect 096, and in case you're wondering, we're one, two, three, four. We are six questions away from having done all the Patreon questions. Um, taking a little longer than I thought, but maybe not quite as much. All Architect 096 says the Athol Highlanders are currently the only army in the UK that I know of that legally answers to the Duke of Athol, although now mostly being a curiosity than a rather an actual fighting force. My question is this: Could another British noble create his own fleet to support the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars? If so, would the fleet be only frigates or heavier ships as well? Uh, could such a private navy last even in a limited role within the larger Royal Navy structures until World War II or even today? Um, it wouldn't last until World War II or even today because technically to be able to legally operate, they would need a privateering letter of mark and the Royal Navy of Britain signed away privateering in the 
mid to late 19th century. So unfortunately, the idea of a private naval force as a combat force wouldn't survive that. Um, they'd have to be folded into the Royal Navy as a whole. Um, could a British noble create their own fleet to support the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars? Yes. Yes, they could. Um, various conglomerates of merchants and other fairly rich individuals did put together their own privateering forces. Um, you saw in the Voyage of the Glorioso, for example, that, that little squadron called the Royal Family that was put put together by a cabal of backers. So a sufficiently rich British noble could have their own ships if they wanted to, um, and potentially even, you know, depending on what they pay for, would they would be powerful enough to operate alongside the Royal Navy. I don't think anyone would be putting all their money into a ship of the line just because, I mean, even apart from enemy hazards, ha the Royal Navy lost a, more ships to the environment than anything else in the Napoleonic Wars. You know, going ashore, getting wrecked, uh, storms, etc. So I can see potentially a really, really naval minded nobleman maybe putting together two or three large sloops of war, so 16 to 20 gunships, maybe a sixth rate or so, as a, sort of a privateering force similar to that royal family force from the Borgia Glorioso, with a job essentially to bring in prize money to fund themselves and his other endeavours, and then maybe going for his pièce de résistance and maybe building a, a big frigate, maybe a, th a heavy fifth rate, a 38 to 40 gunner, you know, all kitted out with the best weaponry, you know, carronades, essentially almost a, a slightly smaller version of some of the US heavy frigates. I think that would be about as far as even the richest of the British nobility could push things. Um, Knight 6831, your your sister is incorrect because I actually do not have a neck beard. I, I do actually shave and maintain my beard very carefully. <laughs> um, Q Fisher asks, during the ironclad dreadnought battleship period of the channel, when is the best time for Australia, um, also known as Emutopia in this darkest of timelines, to embark on an invasion spree if they desire? <laughs> New Zealand will be first on the list. Um, as well as any other tasty looking nearby islands, where and who by would this wave of conquest be most likely stopped? Um, <laughs> okay, now that's a fun one. Um, hmm. Well, your, your problem's going to be that obviously Australia as a unified country doesn't exist in the ironclad era it only actually becomes a single country right before the dreadnought period and during that period i mean obviously it's all part of the, the the british empire but assuming that we're in a, some kind of dark alternate timeline where australia somehow got itself independent maybe the early 1920s if if they've managed yeah maybe the early 1920s because at that point there's been massive naval disarmament and everybody's pretty much sick of war thanks to the first world war so if australia was going to go rogue 1922 would be their best shot not a really good shot but there you go Uh, Blandage asks, are there any naval fiction books you would recommend? Um, unfortunately, not hugely, uh, because as I've covered in a few other dry docs, I don't tend to read naval fiction all that much um, because I've got all of these naval fact books to read. Um, I would say probably the only, I mean, obviously you've got the classic stuff, you know, Master and Commander, um, 
the now it's gone out of my head. The Master Commander series by Patrick O'Brien. Um, the Pelu Indefatigable series, whatever they're called. Um, Hornblower, that's it. The Hornblower series. Those are obviously the classic Age of Sail things. Um, you know, the ones, you know, all the various na naval fictions you've generally heard of. But it, for sci fi, I would the the only one that I would say is definitively a naval fiction series that I've listened to a huge amount of and actually continue to enjoy would be ah uh, it's by Christopher Nuttall uh, the Ark Royal series by Christopher Nuttall even though the Ark Royal itself it's it kind of stops being the Ark Royal series and more of just the Ark Royal universe after about the first three books. Um, that, yeah, I would say that would be the sci-fi series I would recommend. Uh, there are a few others, um, that are out there, which I would, I could definitely recommend certain authors, um, uh, Dr. Clark pointing out, of course, Glenn Stewart, you know, definitely sci-fi sci-fi author, um, author to recommend uh, but the difference between uh, Christopher Nuttall's Ark Royal series is that it's 15 plus books at this point which are spanning a single great arc it's the same with the Master and Commander or the Hornblower series these are big series covering an, a single narrative arc um, whereas Glenn, Glenn Stewart, he does, um, he does do a number of series, you know, maybe two, three, four books or something like that, but there are lots of separate universes. So I think at some point in that question, I started interpreting it as big arcs of single universe naval fiction. Um, So yeah, that, that, those those would be my recommendations. Sharp's Trafalgar is all right. Um, yeah, there's nothing functionally wrong with Sharp's Trafalgar, but it basically takes place in its own little pocket thing that just happens to be occurring at Trafalgar. So yeah, it's 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 decently written, um, but my personal tastes for naval fiction te should tend to be if you're going to touch on major events that actually happen then either get fully involved in them or go off on your own path um i have read the honor well listened to the honorverse on audible um so i say the, the things like the honorverse um cruel seas etc they those are what i mean by like the classics that most people have heard of Dr. Clark has a few recommendations. Apparently he has more free time than I do. Um, Jim Smitty asks, last month when I... Uh, da, da, da. Okay, that question I do I think I did actually answer in a live dry dock. So, George H. Um, let's suppose US oil supplies in the South Pacific in the fall of 1942 were greater than they historically were, and Nimitz succumbed to pressure from King to deploy the Maryland and Colorado for the Guadalcanal campaign. How might Macau's force have made out on the evening of August the 8th had those two battleships also been present, even if equally surprised as the American and Australian cruiser and destroyer force were? Okay, well, first things first. Um, if Maryland and Colorado were deployed for the Guadalcanal campaign, they wouldn't be with Crutchley's forces um, because, you know, as we saw a little bit later on, the US would not put battleships into the immediate waters around Guadalcanal, especially in the front line against the Japanese, um, until they were forced to by essentially not having anything left. Um, if Maryland and Colorado are present for the Guadalcanal campaign, they are either going to be questionably tagging along with the carriers as forms of anti-air escorts although their speed is going to make that a really odd one or they're going to be 
back with the transports offering fire support and guarding the transports against uh, sort of last ditch last ditch guardians against attack and offering the marines fire support that is where they're most likely going to be if however for reasons best left unsaid they've been stuck forward with the rest of Crutchley's forces well then one Crutchley is almost certainly not going to be in command because if there's two battleships there the US is going to send an admiral senior enough to actually be in charge of, of of them and therefore the fleet if they are equally as surprised now that's that's an interesting one because historically it was gunfire for the most part that did in for the two cruiser groups and most of that gunfire is not going to overly trouble maryland and colorado it'll damage them it'll mess them up but it's fundamentally probably not going to sink them which means they can then eventually get round to returning fire however quickly and that's not going to be a good thing for the Japanese um, however they do make very tempting targets for long lances so I think it depends on how quickly Macau's forces identified them as battleships if they don't realize they're battleships and they just go after them the same way they went after everything else then yeah sure spray them down with five inch six inch and eight inch gunfire and just see what happens when 16 inch turrets start turning your way um, albeit, you know, the Americans don't have a world's greatest night fighting doctrine at this point, so some Japanese ships might survive and be able to escape. The flip side, of course, is the ultimate disaster if someone goes, hey, those are American battleships, why don't we fire all our long lances at them? Which isn't going to end well. Um... Walter Broad US says no Tom Clancy um, <laughs> for the fiction recommendations. Most of Tom Clancy's books don't cover naval fiction per se. Um, I mean, Hunt for the Red October is quite good. Um, Red Storm Rising. Red Storm Rising's all right. There's a few too many DSX Machina for my taste. And outside of those two, I can't really think of any of his other works that have significant amounts of naval combat in them that I would honestly hand on heart recommend. Uh, I mean, there's SSN where uh, 688i goes... Six, is it 668? Yeah, 668i. Six, six, the um, Cheyenne goes on a, like a one-sub-killing spree in the Western Pacific against the Chinese Navy, but... Uh, there's only so many, you know, random Chinese ships which apparently got dropped on their head when they were young that you can read about being destroyed before it gets a little boring. <laughs> and the last Patreon question is uh, from Patrick Donnelly, who asks, how would Admiral Halsey's ability to command the third fleet between August of 44 and January 45 be affected if he chose a carrier Enterprise or one of the Essexes as his flagship instead of New Jersey. Um, he might actually have somewhat reduced facilities compared to a battleship for his staff and so forth, because obviously a battleship, especially the Iowa's, I mean, okay, New Jersey herself is not the one that's designed as the flagship with flagship facilities, but she still does have quite a lot of facilities aboard to accommodate an admiral and his staff, whereas a carrier has to be do has to do you know the full range of ship activities and the full range of air activities and not usually known for the world's largest superstructure so um they can handle apples and their stuff but probably not quite as well um and of course the other thing is the carriers have a certain amount of restriction on their operations because when you know when they're conducting fly tops they have to be going in a certain direction which could take the, the you out of the line so i think broadly speaking halsey's ability to command would be slightly impaired which is probably why he chose to run off of new jersey instead of on one of the carriers but 
not as much as you might think. I think you could actually pull that off. Um, okay, apparently there's an echo that's come from somewhere. Okay, I've switched the microphone off and on. Has that helped? Oh, well, I should probably speak, uh, to be honest. Has, has turning the microphone off and on helped? Let's see. Do, do, do. Fixed. Okay. Cool. Weird. Okay, apparently turning the microphone off and on is legitimately a effective measure. You, I don't know, other people still hear it. Okay, what the heck is causing that? Hmm. Hello, testing, 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 one, two, one, two. How's that? Uh, I unplugged the microphone, which apparently has made, um, it made XSplit forget that my microphone existed, of all things. Is this working now? Huzzah, fixed, fixed and no echo. Cool. Right. Okay, so. <laughs> that was weird. Anyway, let's um, let's get on to the Super Chats, uh, which Fleet of Oceans has kindly provided with me. For, for, with me? For me. Um, John Stanley, how long did it take for Germany to debug their torpedoes? Um... Depends what you mean by debug. So when they had the issues with the magnetic detonators up in the Norway campaign, if I recall correctly, it took them between six to 12 months. Um, it took six to 12 months to actually resolve all the issues with the magnetic detonators, but to get the torpedoes actually functional was a lot faster because they could still use the contact detonators and they worked fine um just not quite as you know quite as nicely quite as lethally as the magnetic ones um but of course it, there was a bit of a lag of them you know receiving the information that there were problems and then figuring out what they were going to do about it so i think um for the initial if i remember correctly the, for the from the initial reports of we have problems to here's our stopgap solution while we try and fix the magnetic detonation feature was about three to four months. Um, and the whole thing was resolved to the extent it ever was going to be within about a year. Um, Sapa Ninja says, good morning, Greg. Oh, of course I forget <laughs> over where Sapa Ninja is. It is morning as opposed to 10 o'clock at night, uh, which is what it is here. Um, what do you think is the best example of a naval Pyrrhic victory in history? And what about purely the 20th century? Now, someone someone asked me a very similar question recently. It's, it is a... 
It is a little bit of a difficult one because naval Pyrrhic victories are relatively rare. I mean, the, the, the easy answers would be something like actually probably the Santa Battle of Santa Cruz Islands because, you know, tactically speaking, the Japanese win that one in the more American carrier hulls go down than Japanese ones do and the Americans seed the field. So, you know, they've technically won at the cost of a lot of their aircraft plus damage to their ships and you know there's a reason there's not another major carrier battle <laughs> for the Guadalcanal campaign um you know is it, that is very it is almost the definition of a victory that they could not afford to repeat and didn't um <laughs> prior to that hmm Age of Sail Pyrrhic victories. Hmm. I mean, if you wanted to be really convoluted, you could go with um, the Battle of Chesapeake Bay, Battle of Virginia Capes. You know, France manages to... Obviously, there's still be fighting at Yorktown, but France manages to go a good way at, at that fight towards securing American independence but as I've covered before, kind of ends up bankrupting itself in so doing um, with that and the various other naval operations. <clears throat> um, John Hart asks, <coughs> um, in 1890, if Britain doesn't hand Heligoland over to Germany, how does this affect operations by the Royal Navy and High Seas Fleet? Does it become the Gibraltar of the North Sea? Um, well, certainly the Kaiser and the... Uh, German naval high command were absolutely dreading the idea of somebody owning Heligoland and just waiting right, <laughs> waiting just the other side of the Jade Estuary for for the Germans. Um, the the problem is by 1914, even if the Royal Navy hasn't quite appreciated the risks from submarines, they do understand the risk from mines and torpedo boats. So. Basing any large number of ships out of Heligoland is not really viable. What the Royal Navy probably will do, however, is base smaller torpedo craft, submarines, etc. from Heligoland. Uh, because even some of the, not quite the Holland boats, but certainly the A and B class submarines with the relatively limited ranges can still patrol off of Wilhelmshaven, etc. from Heligoland. So they can definitely be a massive thorn in the German side, especially if the you've got maybe fast mine layers running in to try and um, disrupt German port activities. Would it become the Gibraltar of the North Sea? I don't know. I mean, it's. I think a lot of it is going to depend on how much the Royal Navy fortifies it. You know, do they use it as a useful port from which we'll base short range attack and patrol craft until something happens to it or do they decide to decide to go the whole hog and stick you know heavy heavy guns and bunkers and all sorts of layered defenses in there because Heligoland is so close to Germany that unless it's armed armored and garrisoned to resemble something of a mini fortress world the high seas fleet can just surround it, bombard it, and land troops at some point when they can get around to it. Now, admittedly, this may pin them in place for the Royal Navy to come in and attack, um, but it is very, very close to Germany and relatively far from the Royal Navy fleet bases. But of course, if it's basically just bristling with guns, the Germans may conclude it's actually a little bit too costly to try. So... Yeah, it, it, I, the, I think the coin toss is going to come down to how much does the Royal Navy actually fortify the place. Because it, it might just be annoying, cost the Germans a few ships and then get overrun. Or it might be 
you know, the sword of Damocles that hangs over the high seas fleet's head the entire time, whilst they try and think of a way of taking it that doesn't involve days and days of operations that cost them a bunch of ships and put them right smack dab in the sights of the Grand Fleet. Uh, Brackman asks, uh, one more for fleet, apparently. Um, In 1213, what would have happened if the English fleet lost the attack on the French fleet and got sunk for it? <laughs> I, well, if... Oh, okay, what you say, one more for fleet, as in a, a super chat that fleet has to answer. Right, gotcha. Okay. Um, let's make sure we're both talking about the same naval battle. Um... Okay, so this is presumably the, the rather wonderfully named Battle of Dam, and boy, did the French lose <laughs> lose a lot of ships. Um, honestly, honestly I, 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 I I don't, don't know enough about, about that battle to actually answer you immediately. Um. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to go have to look at that one, Brackman. Um, if you could, if if you could drop me a email or a Discord DM, I will come back to you with a proper answer to that. But I, I need to read up more on that battle first. Uh, the echo is back. I think I know why. Right. Um, okay, has that? Has that solved the echo problem? The last one, the last chat I can see is Chief Flappy saying Darth Track is back. I just played around with the setting. Has that solved the problem? No. Okay. I'm good. Test, 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 test. And, and what, what about, about now? now? Last, Last one I can see is dragon, dragon red. red. Um, um, I'm um, no, no, okay. Okay, okay, what, what about, about now? now? Last, Last one, one I can, can see, see at the moment is Chris, 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 Chris Gom. Go, uh, no. no. Two, Two mics. Mm. You know. You know. Okay, how about now? Stop. 
still a problem. Okay, what about now? Better, Jeff Holloway says. Is that better for everyone else? I just realized I'm sitting there going, has it got better without saying anything? Better, but still echo. Um, you know, what, what the problem is, is NVIDIA Broadcast suddenly decided to turn itself on. Hmm. No, apparently it's not helping. A single echo. Okay. Where the heck has this happened? Because I found NVIDIA Broadcast had turned itself on. What else have we got? Okay, let's try it. Let's try that. How's that then? Pat CB says pretty good now. Hopefully it's solved. Yeah, I need to keep talking. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, Jack Race is dragging a pipe. Um, is this helping at all? Sounds good. Still the electronic voices, no echo, but you sound hollow. Still not the ori original. Okay. Um, Okay, let's try this one. Let's try this. Hopefully that's good enough. Right, okay, it's helping apparently. Right, let me know. Okay, so yeah, just for those of you who are wondering, for some reason, NVIDIA Broadcast suddenly turned itself on and deselected itself as the default input on the Windows sound settings. And... Um, XSplit was still set to this Yeti X that I'm using. So, yeah, you were getting two inputs, essentially. You were basically getting two inputs from the same microphone, but one was routing through NVIDIA Broadcast, and so was coming in a little bit later. Right. Anyway, now that I've disabled NVIDIA Broadcast, um, <laughs> 
victory the victory over himself um asks be happy to see you at naval air museum at pensacola yeah i'm looking forward to it did you consider visiting saint augustine we have a very large well-preserved spanish coastal fortress in a shakespeare era historical district um i thought about it the problem is it's everything is on an incredibly tight and compressed schedule um so if i spend the day at pensacola naval air museum which is what i am going to do i just do not have the time if i was on a slightly longer um slightly longer trip then yes i would and i probably will come back and visit it at some point but put it this way i'm driving after uss kid closes the day before i'm driving from baton rouge to pensacola that afternoon dash evening and then i'm going to pensacola naval air museum obviously in the morning and that evening the evening that i'm at the naval air museum of the dam at the naval air museum i then have a plane to catch to norfolk to get me to then to the mariners museum um for the following day so unfortunately i really don't have any time um right john thomas asks if congress passes a stronger neutrality act preventing wilson from selling arms to britain um lusitania now carries no war supplies is she still sunk and is there a zimmerman telegram um, yeah, Lusitania will still be sunk because the you know the the justification that Lusitania was carrying, however much explosives or ammunition people claimed that she was or wasn't carrying, and whether those count as war supplies or not, is all post hoc justification. Um, the Lusitania was targeted and sunk because she happened to be in the area and because she happened to practically run over the U-boat that sank her. So yes, she is still sunk. Um, as far as there being a Zimmerman telegram, um, maybe it depends. It depends how much of an impact that Stronger Neutrality Act has if public opinion is still swinging towards britain and germany thinks that there is a chance that the us might get involved in the war with the U with, uh, in the war against germany they probably still will send that um because you know even without selling war supplies america trading with britain and not trading with germany is a bit of a economic imbalance yeah so i i don't know if there would be a zimmerman telegram if there's absolutely no armament sales at or ward like supply sales to to britain but lusitania definitely is being sunk um walter broad us any visit to annapolis yes i will be visiting annapolis um <laughs> but of course the thing is you know unless you happen to be a instructor officer or cadet in the US Navy, um, there's no point in telling people that I'm going to be at Annapolis because they won't let you in the gate. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Mike Lima 777 asks Could Hood or Prince of Wales have hit Bismarck's turret and detonated the ready rounds and propellant um, as mentioned in a recent dry dock? Um, well, Rodney did blow out Bruno, turret Bruno with a direct hit. Offhand, I don't know if either the 14 or 15 inch shells have enough penetration at the ranges Hood and Prince of Wales were engaging at to still penetrate the front of the turret and cause a detonation in any ready ammunition. I suspect that the ranges they're fighting at probably not. There is, of course, the out, very, very outside chance of a shell slotting itself in the elevation gap <laughs> rather than hitting the front turret face. But then, of course, you've, the flip side is, was Bismarck actually carrying 
much, if any, uh, ready ammunition in her turret at Battle of Denmark Strait. And even if she was, had she expended it by the time Hood or Prince of Wales could realistically have gotten a hit in. Um, so, I mean, potentially there is a small chance that with a, you know, as much of a one in a million shot as the hit on Hood was, a hit that neatly threads above or below one of Bismarck's main guns through the elevation gap and into the turret would be a one in a billion shot. But if that did happen, and if Bismarck was in that particular scenario carrying ready use ammo and hadn't expended it, then yes, in theory, the, that detonation could have then set that on fire. But yeah, you know, that's a ridiculously convoluted chain of events to happen. Runeslayer says hello, so I say hello back. Um, HMS Ford says, any trouble driving on the right-hand side of the road? Um, I've been to the US enough times now that no, actually, I'm just kind of uh, used to it. It takes me about five minutes. Usually by the, by the time I've gotten out of the car hire place at the first airport that I land in in the US and worked my way onto the main road, I've pretty much remembered how to drive on the on the US side of the road. Um, Animal 16365 asks, during the age of sail and the early to mid part of the channel's coverage, i.e. before aircon, how common was it for sailors to sleep out on deck? In the age of sail, actually very common. If the, if the temperature was ridiculously hot, sleeping out on the upper deck was far from unknown um, on ships. It, it basically just came down to, has it become unbearably hot down on the gun decks? If so, yeah, well, a bunch of us are now sleeping on the upper decks. As time goes on, that becomes less and less common, in part because there's less and less upper deck space proportionally as turrets and superstructure and so forth start to take over. Um, but in peacetime, it's not entirely unknown in really 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 hot environments um, but also by the time you get to the late 19th early 20th century even if aircon itself isn't necessarily fully implemented ventilation of some sort usually is um, Vulcan Rumble I'm leaving on the 15th so I'm my flight is on the evening of Thursday the 15th and is heading straight for the U. Uh, well, actually, no, heading to the Dulles, Washington, D.C.'s airport, um, but then catching a connecting flight to the U.S. South Coast. I do need to look up what the weather's going to be like. Roger B. pointing out the Mercy Class hospital ship. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Converted super. Oh, they're converted super tankers, actually, as opposed to. Cargo vessels. I suppose that makes sense because the engine is right at the back, which gives you the best amount of space. Um, naval Guide asks, if the pre-First World War Canadian naval plan, which called for the construction of three Queen Elizabeth class battleships, was completed, how does this change World War I and World War II? Um, well, if there are three additional QEs, where are they going to be put? Is well, well, that's one of the first questions, <laughs> because a you know a, the divisions of the battle squadrons were supposed to be four ships, so the Queen Elizabeths that were present at Jutland fit that quite nicely. If you've got another three, that's not quite enough for a full battle squadron, but you having seven or a division of a battle squadron, but having seven. That's pushing things a little bit. Um, you know, I at Jutland the Canadian QEs are well, one of the blocks of QEs, either the British or Canadian QEs are probably still going to be with the Grand Fleet. Broadly speaking, I don't think it'll change that much in in the overall, you know, Jutland, etc. What it will change is the world is World War Two because the Royal Navy is going to have to be is going to have to look at ditching something um, and in fact they might 
continue to build Agincourt because if they if they've got three QEs coming from Canada, then building Agincourt becomes potentially more imperative. Although on the other hand, they are already building five with Malaya, so maybe they have got two two units of eight anyway. Okay, yeah, that actually they might, they might just stick with that. So okay, so if we've got eight QEs instead of five. That then leaves the British in a bit of an interesting situation because when it comes to the naval treaty era, they can't keep, well, initially they can keep all their 15 inch ships because historically they kept some of the 13.5 inch ships until Nelson and Rodney came online. And then at the London treaty, they gave them, gave those up. Um, but, I think, well, I think it depends what happens in the 30s. Does Canada want them back <laughs> well, as Canada becomes fully independent? But assuming that they don't, assuming they are an out outright gift, come Lon the London Naval Treaty, if you've got 15 ships, well, you've got, you're going to keep Hood, Renown and Repulse. Um, and uh, Nelson and Rodney. So that's five. If you've got eight QEs, that means you're going to be ditching the two oldest revenge class. Um, no, you'd be ditching three revenge class in that fact case, actually. Hmm. Now there's a conundrum for you. I suppose then, you know, I suppose then some of the revenges could become training ships like Iron Duke did historically. It would mean you've got a lot more 15 inch gun turrets lying around for potential vanguard conversions and then the question then the question is going to be you know, how many get refitted because historically the refit schedule is pretty tight so you only of, of the qes you only get war spike which is kind of a halfway house and then queen elizabeth and valiant um if you have three more unmodernized aka bar and malaya level qes the difference between that and the R's, not really hugely apart from the fact that the QEs can actually stay at sea for longer because their condensers aren't broken. Um, but if more of them are modernized, then that could potentially quite heavily impact World War II, especially just because they've got a bit more speed. Uh, John Thomas says, are you spending any time in Norfolk? Uh, well, I'm landing in Norfolk and then driving across the water to Newport News for the Mariners Museum. Um, <laughs> William Potts. Unfortunately, I do not have 29 hours in the day. That would be really nice because that would mean I could get five hours more sleep. <laughs> um, Fleet of Oceans asks, German airships in World War One could carry 10 tons of bombs. Uh, assuming a carry weight of 20 tons. OK, well, OK, this is a, a, an alter. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure they couldn't. Assuming that they could carry 20 tons of bombs, can these new airships carry one or more of any of the existing naval guns? And what role might these aerial gunboats serve? Um, yes, uh, any cruiser grade gun could be carried. Uh, a six inch gun. I mean, a six inch gun plus ammunition, plus mounting point, plus loading, etc. Yeah, OK, you could get a six inch gun aboard with all the other uh, stuff that you need to as well. I mean, theoretically, you might be able to get an 8-inch or a 9.2-inch, but you'd really be pushing it um, once you start taking into account ammunition and all the other bits. Um, what role might those aerial gunboats serve? Um, I mean, in theory, it would mean that you could use them as recon a bit more because you'd theoretically be able to engage destroyers and so forth with a bit of an advantage. <laughs> I think, to be honest, that practically, if somebody managed to invent uh, a Zeppelin that was able to ca carry a full six inch gun with all of the accoutrements, you might actually see them being used in more accurate bombing at that stage. I, you know, they, I don't think there'd be a huge naval use for them. 
but they would definitely be you know because it's a gun it can be targeted them essentially being used to shell targets with a bit more precision than just lobbing gravity bombs out of the side of them or out of the gondolas that would probably definitely be a thing um robert yingling asks if you were to make a modern battleship of the montana type what would you want to include vertical launch sea ram sea was helicopters etc um modern that's a modern ship modern warship question so basically i don't really do those on the channel um unfortunately very very briefly i would essentially say look at some of the more ambitious conversion plans for the iowas in the 80s not the battle carrier versions but the ones where they were looking at taking out the aft turret for um a bunch more weaponry that would essentially be my approach for the montanas you know put the heavy weaponry aft uh, put some of the lighter stuff like sea whiz along the sides sub, sort of instead of some of the five inch and you keep the forward two turrets because otherwise why why bother um Peter Tordenskjold asks, could Force G have been able to shadow Graf Spey until Force H could arrive about a week later, or at least until Cumberland could have reached them, instead of going into battle with the German ship? In theory, yes, they do have the speed advantage. Um, yeah, actually, yeah, because they've got the speed advantage. Graf Spey can't run away from them but she could try and slip away from them or you know head into a neutral port or whatever so yeah in theory it could be possible especially holding out just till cumberland gets there so they've got a few more guns going into the fight but i can entirely understand why uh, ajax achilles and exeter did what they did because that's that was a way to ensure that grash bay was dealt with one way or the other there and then as opposed to bargaining oh, for flip's sake on what Uh, this is really annoying. Why is this echo happening now? <clears throat> okay, let's try this. Okay, let's try this. <clears throat> Is the echo resolved? Is the echo resolved now? <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Echo test. One, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah, okay. I don't know what's going on does it tonight. I will have to investigate later. Um, anyway. <laughs> um, where were we? Uh, warning for live segments. Okay. Uh, Stoned Habit says, I'll give you 20 quid to sing the chorus to sing the Bismarck by Johnny Horton. Um, maybe next live stream. In fact, actually, Fleet, can you 
remind me next live stream that I must sing the chorus to sing the Bismarck, sing the Bismarck at the end of the next live stream for Stone Abbott. I'm not going to do it tonight, partly because I'm very tired and partly because, as you can probably tell by my consumption of amber in my voice, my my voice is a little delicate since I spent Saturday basically just giving constant narration for Victory and Warrior. Um, but I will do it. Uh, Chris Marshall asks, World War One: if the high seas fleet never sails and the Battle of Jutland never happens, does it change the Royal Navy outlook and what effect does it have on World War II? Um, yeah, the Royal Navy is going to wa keep wanting that Jutland battle, that, that sort of the Trafalgar battle, because if it doesn't happen in World War I, because the high seas fleet is too scared to sail out, then, well, clearly deterrence works, but the Royal Navy is going to want, still want that big battle. Um, what effect does it have on World War II? Um, I mean, again, it's one of those very long distance forecasts for things, because some of the issues that were resolved by uh, it battle experience at Jutland obviously won't necessarily get resolved, but they might get picked up later. I'd say the single biggest effect on World War II would probably be the the shift to night fighting, because prior to the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy hadn't really thought about night fighting that much. After the Battle of Jutland, the Royal Navy became slightly obsessed by it. So the very heavy look uh, view on night action that the Royal Navy has in World War II prob almost certainly isn't going to be there. They might still have night, night fighting training, but it's not going to be anywhere near as heavily emphasised as it was historically. Um, <laughs> sea Dodd has built me a hospital ship. Thank you very much. Um, all right, we have one, two, three, four, five super chats left to go, and then it's then it'll be uh questions from the audience, especially if you've got any questions about the upcoming US trip, I will probably prioritize those because it's a, well, so if, if you're going to come and say hi, you're probably a best, one of the best chances before I leave to get details, um, but I will try and answer other random questions as well. Um, Church of Petrol asks, do you think you'll make it to Charleston one day for Yorktown, Lafayette and Hunley? Um, I did actually go to Charleston in April 2022 uh, to see Yorktown. And I do plan on returning there possibly this September to see Laffey and Hunley. I'm really hope put it this way, I'm really hoping I get there in September. It is on my schedule of things to do. Um Brett McDowell, you mentioned in a video about Canadian aircraft carriers an offhand remark about a Canadian mutiny. Uh, could you expand on that? Um depends which one you ref you refer to. If you're a blah, blah. If you are referring to the one aboard HMCS Uganda, um, that's well, it's essentially to do with um, the well. The, the short version is Canadians. A lot of Canadian sailors had signed up for what they called hostilities only postings, um, which meant you know we're at war. You sign up, you fight for the duration of the war. Once the war's over, you can go home. But when they signed up to that, the war was with Germany and Italy. And by, you know, early 1945, that war was over. And then they were being asked to go and fight the Japanese. The Japanese hadn't been on their listing for, you know, the, the Japanese hadn't been the enemy when they signed up. That campaign bear on this pre-atomic bombs looked like it might last another couple of years but the canadian army for the most part wasn't going to be asked to fight in that war so there were and ele elements of the canadian air force as well um which meant that a lot of canadian armed forces personnel were being released back into civilian life which meant of course they got first pick at various jobs uh civilian jobs ahead of the Navy guys, and so for 
political reasons, the politicians in Canada decided to try and square that particular circle by <coughs> actually asking, the, getting the crew to vote as to whether or not they wanted to keep fighting. And shockingly, when the crew were asked, do you want to go and fight in a sweltering Pacific against an enemy that you weren't actually, you didn't actually sign up to fight against originally for another couple of years whilst everybody who signed up for all the other armed services goes and grabs all the peacetime jobs, they voted no. <laughs> well, to be fair, not all of them voted no, but a good chunk of them did. I, I believe that's the one that um, you're referring to. If, if it's a different one, then obviously I can expand on that later. Um, ba -ba -bum. <clears throat> Nozdormu89. How would the Pacific War be affected if Japan had parity with the US in radar development? Um, it would make the night actions an awful lot bloodier because obviously the US leveraging its advantages in radar towards the tail end of 1942 and onwards was a huge, huge um, advantage for them and grew into an even bigger one as time went on. Um, so if Japan has just as much radar, um, then, you know, they, the Japanese have a better night fighting doctrine to start with. And if they're able to exploit that with radar, yeah, that could get very messy. And of course, the other thing is if they've got parity in radar development, that means anti-aircraft fire control radar and general fire control radar as well, air search, etc. Um, that could cost the US an awful lot more in terms of aircraft attack on Japanese ships and therefore you know, preserve more Japanese ships so the war gets dragged out longer. The US still ultimately has an industrial advantage, so they still will crush Japan, but actually you know, the Japanese having one-to-one -one parity with the US and radar development might be one of the things that could actually legitimately extend the war by a significant time. Um, Way into Adventures asks, Annapolis, important question, visiting Annapolis, um, is the restriction you mention due to the size of the venue or instruction by the Academy? Uh, other active duties should have access. So, um, so at Annapolis, I'm actually going to visit the US Naval Institute, which is on the same campus, as I'm sure uh, those of you who are in the US Navy know. So the reason I say it's limited access is basically because it's an active US Navy base. They don't take random visitors. <laughs> so I'm going to be at USNI talking with USNI, US Naval Institute Press, about various things and doing a bit of filming, etc. So, you know, if you happened to be a serving US Navy, um, you happen to be a serving US Navy personnel, that's a really bad sentence, but you know what, if you happen to be serve, actively serving in the US Navy, and therefore you can get access to the Annapolis Naval Academy grounds, then in theory, um, assuming it doesn't bother USNI too much, um, obviously people can are free to come and say hi, <laughs> but obviously the you know people for the, the general public, they're not going to just allow people onto the base for obvious reasons. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, <laughs> William Potts says, I like Darth Dustbin. Well, obviously, I have no idea what I'm sounding like with the echo until if I go back over the live stream. Um, John Thomas asks, if ships had visible avatars and they aren't anime like Azure Lane, but more realistic, how would you picture HMS Victory and Queen Elizabeth's avatars? Um, HMS Victory, I see, well, if you've seen, um, 
Greek statues of Athena Nike, and that's not sponsored by the shoes. That's uh, a vi Athena, the goddess Athena, as in uh, in her aspect of victory, because there's Pallas Athena and various other aspects of Athena. But the, the victorious warrior Athena, I think victory's avatar would look a little bit like that, but a kind of older, battered, more grizzled veteran warrior look. Because that effectively reflects what she is. She's a you know a hard fighting, leading leading warship. But her most famous victory comes when she's you know at an age where most ships would be retired, and she keeps going. So, if you imagine a a almost like a hardened battle axe of a of a fighter in the best possible sense, <laughs> you know maybe with an eye patch and scars everywhere, but a very mean look. Almost a I suppose if you've watched the Harry of read the Harry Potter series, almost a female version of Mad Eye Moody, but with more stabby things. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth's avatar. You know, given that she got that big modernization refit in just prior to World War Two, I'm imagining Queen Elizabeth the first because HMS Queen Elizabeth. But in you know the latest trendy fashionable gear of the late of whatever what late nineteen thirties women's fashion was. For some reason, yeah, I, I don't know why I thought of that, but I did. So now you have to think about it as well. Um, <laughs> Xavier Blackwell asks: Assuming HMS Victory could somehow sneak up on an early model USS Fletcher and deliver a broadside, what kind of damage would you expect? Um, I mean, at, at point blank range. Oh, here goes the mental calculations. Thirty-two pound a cannibal would probably get through an inch or slightly under an inch of steel. Maybe not. Oh. I mean, it would certainly hurt, and there's enough, if it's a point-blank broadside, there's enough shot running around that, you know, the torpedo mounts are probably going to take a hit or two. There's probably going to be a few holes in the hull, a couple of, oh, quite a few holes in the superstructure. Uh, but the thicker portions of a Fletcher's hull might just about, and sort of maybe the, the gun mounts, if they're at an angle, might just about be able to stop or significantly slow a 32-pounder. And certainly the 24 and 18 or 12-pounders, depending on her, what time period her armament's in, probably be able to stop those. So it would definitely hurt very, very badly, but there would be enough weaponry still functional aboard the Fletcher to be able to turn it around before Victory can reload and repeat the question. Um, so yes, uh, I think that is all the Super Chats. Um, Carter Johnson says, oh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for watching for five years. I, I mean, I obviously I appreciate everybody who, who watches, but occasionally when I see a name that I recognize from comments from, you know, the early days before 500 subscribers, before a thousand kind of thing, it does it does warm my heart a little bit to know that I've managed to keep people's interests for more than half a decade. Right. So. Um. Stephen Richards says, asks, how, how's the Fluffy Research Assistant? So I'm taking questions from general chat now. Um, so Fluffy Research Assistant, Abel Seaman Floppy, he's good. He is very large, even for a deer hound. Um, and he is currently, I believe, asleep. Um, because we took him out for a very long run today in a nice big field. So he we went charging around quite happily. Um, but he has his own way of letting us know when he's done because deer hounds are very high energy, very fast dogs, but they're kind of like cheetahs in that 
they run really 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 fast but after they've done a certain amount of running they're done for the day yeah with a deer hound you generally don't have to worry about them chewing up all your furniture and running around yapping the entire day give them a good run and then they're like yeah i'm done i'm done and the way he tells us that is that he just sits down he just sits down in the grass and look watches the world go by by and that's his way of saying no i'm i'm done running now i want to go home uh, and he did that <laughs> and uh so yeah, he basically came in, had drank about half a bowl of water and then just went and lay down and essentially passed out. So he's probably still there. He might have popped up by now to have some of his meat because he's he's fed raw food. But he'll probably, if he has, he'll have just eaten it and gone back to sleep. Rednil Rednil asks, uh, I seem to remember you giving a quote along the lines of a dreadnought fears nothing but God and its own kin. I can't find anything about it. Do you know who it's from or do I remember? Um, I think it's uh, another of its own kind and I think that's from Admiral Fisher. Uh, but again, drop me an email or Discord message and I can look it up in the relevant script and see where I got that quote from. Um... Calvin Green 90. The Lord Nelson class was delayed till after the Dreadnought was completed. Would they have been more useful when completed if the 12 inch guns had been replaced with 9.2 inch guns and the engines replaced with turbines, i.e. making them gigantic armoured cruisers? Um, not particularly. I mean, as kind of flagship battleships, they were actually quite useful in the non-primary non threat, uh, non threat areas, Gallipoli and Mediterranean and so forth. So, you know, making them the ultimate armored cruiser in an era when battle cruisers existed, probably not a brilliant idea. Um, it'd be interesting to see maybe if they'd gone full Cunaberti with them and replaced the, the, the twin, the, yeah, the twin 9.2s with the single 12s, made them mini dreadnoughts. Um, uh, turb en trip the engines replaced by turbines. Theoretically, yes, but um, engines are one of the first major bits of infrastructure that go into a ship, so they would have had to rip up what they'd already done. So I don't think that would really help them. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Mm hmm Everything skipped. Vicky asks, why did the US continue to try to level bomb ships from high altitude B-17s even after this proved to be useless instead of using the highly durable B-17s for low altitude attacks? Um, honestly, mostly into service rivalry. Uh, the, the US AAF was beloved of its high altitude bombing and its obsession with uh, the Norden bomb site and all these other things it had been promised or had promised others that it could do. And essentially just thought, well, this, this is what we've practiced. This is what we've trained for. This is what we're going to be going and doing. Uh, the, the dangers of low altitude attack were relatively well known. You know, there's a lot more guns that can come to bear at you at those kinds of ranges. So it's kind of a mix of risk assessment and also inter, inter in, institutional rivalry, not wanting to admit they're wrong. <laughs> um, plus, to be honest, whilst they are very durable, B-17s are not the most maneuverable of creatures. Um, Twin-engined medium bombers are much better suited for that kind of attack profile. Joel Montgomery says, speaking of subscribers, you're approaching 500,000. Any plans for a celebration? Yeah, probably. Um, yeah, as and when we do hit 500k, there'll probably be a few, I'll probably do a few bits and pieces. There'll be a few, maybe giveaways, some giveaways and so forth to, that I'll do. Um, obviously, I did essentially give away a ton of stuff 
with my tabletop wargaming giveaway a few weeks ago. But I think there's a few more things that can be uh, shook loose as well. Um, <laughs> Sean Riley asks, I recently purchased Rising Sun, Falling Skies and Shattered Sword. Now I need recommendations for River Plate and Coral Sea. Any suggestions? So for Coral Sea... There are a few good ones, but if you can wait a little bit, John Parshall is com is working his way through to doing a book called literally 1942, um, which will obviously include Coral Sea, and I'm really looking forward to it. So that would that would definitely be one. Um, Battle of the River Plate. I've got a really good one about that somewhere on this shelf actually. Uh, where are you? Battles. I'll have to find it later. There is a there is a really oh uh, yeah um, there you go. The drama of Grafsch Bay and the Battle of the Plate uh, by Peter Davies. Now that does actually talk quite a lot about the film as well. But it's a massive thing, so there's a lot of a lot of information about the actual battle as well. Megascro says pictures on Discord of Doggo. I suppose I could put some actually. Um, how can I do this? I think I can actually because I have WhatsApped a few pictures of the Doggo. So if I save that, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to try and save a couple of pictures of Floppy the dog. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Come on, WhatsApp. So I can save those to my computer. Just checking if there's another one or just leave it at that. Okay. Oh, hang on a minute. Where did I put that one? There we go. That's a really good one. Okay. Right. Stage one, pictures acquired. Stage two. Um, Right, stage two is Aha! It seems to be working. Stage two, I'm currently importing pictures of Floppy the Doggo. Right now, if I close that, and now I should be able to swap over and show you pictures of Floppy the dog. 
then I can... Okay, that's not going to work. You know, there's Floppy at HMS Warrior. Floppy resting, floppy running, very large floppy. So yes, there you go. Those, those are some pictures of uh, Floppy the dog. He's a very large. And in fact, there is one other. Yes, I can bring this file in. So yes, yeah, so this is uh, Floppy the dog <laughs> when we first got him and as he is now. And as you can see, when he was, when we first had him, he was, uh, when we first got him, that is him on his little red pillow as a little puppy. And he's now just over a year old. And that is him <laughs> as he is now sitting, uh, well, that's the same pillow. It's just now that pillow only accommodates his head. <laughs> um, he is he is a Scottish deerhound, so he is the speed version of an Irish wolfhound, basically. Um, right. So with that diversion, um, Mark Bass asks: Could HMS Victory hit anything in the water from her current position in the dry dock? Um, I was there on Saturday, mentally thinking. Okay, so her, I mean, at the moment she's in the middle of refit, so her starboard broadside would just rip up the scaffolding. But assuming that that wasn't there, directly in Victory's line of fire would actually be some of the museum buildings, but the guns can be swiveled slightly, which would mean, yes, actually, if Victory's starboard battery was swiveled to the right, i.e. facing aft, as much as the guns can can traverse, then yes, she would be able to shoot out into Portsmouth Harbour, although that indirect line of fire would be the first docking point for um, the Royal Navy's carriers, which would be uh, interesting. Um... Iwindil says, which was the last of the great navies that kept old style guns only, no rockets or missiles warships after World War II? Was it the Soviet Union with the Sverdlovs? Um, hmm. Well, it's post-World War II question, so I don't know strictly. Um, I, I, I would kind of suspect maybe the US with the, with uh, the Iowas that were brought back for Vietnam, maybe? But I, I say, being post-World War II, I don't know precisely. Um, Lofen asks, was there any other admiral in the German Navy except for Dönitz who looked at Plan Z and said, this is stupid and impractical? Most of them, actually. Mo most of the Kriegsmarine High Command knew that Plan Z wasn't going to work. Um, German industry just wasn't large enough to do it. Uh, certainly the naval building industry, but they'd been asked to produce a plan for a fleet that could do certain things, and so they were going to produce a plan that could do it and try their best to fulfil it. Um, but yeah, most most of the German Admiralty were very aware of the fact that it would take a miracle, a literal miracle for Germany to actually keep up with the production for Plan Z. Okay, it's five minutes past 11, so I think I'm going to keep going for another 10, 15 minutes or so, and then I'm going to call it a night.
Du, 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 du. Nathan D. Asks, asks, if the U.S. manages to get a Lexington class completed instead of USS West Virginia as a direct counterpart to HMS Hood, how bad is this in the U for the U.S. in World War II? Um, it could be good or bad, because if you've got a theoretical Lexington class battlecruiser sitting in the place that West Virginia was historically at Pearl Harbor, I don't think you're getting her back. The, they're, they're a bit it's a bit more fragile and a lot heavier so salvaging would be a lot more of a pig um and probably would take more catastrophic damage in the first place on the other hand if if the theoretical lexington class is not there and is off elsewhere i.e you know doesn't get hit at pearl harbor that might not actually be too bad a thing for the u.s because it would be fast with an awful lot of deck space, which would mean you would immediately have a fast, heavy aircraft carrier escort right from the word go. So you wouldn't have to worry about waiting for North Carolina and Washington to work out their propeller vibration issues, etc. You know, Coral Sea, you could have a fast battleship or battlecruiser, I suppose, sitting there guarding Yorktown and or Lexington and you know so on and so forth for the various raids so um if you ha it, it could accompany enterprise and hornet for the raid uh, for the doolittle raid it could accompany yorktown hornet and enterprise for midway you know there's lots of various places where it could provide either additional anti-aircraft gunfire support or just that bit of additional security that might give the US Navy a little bit more confidence in what it's doing, like maybe launch the aircraft of the Doolittle Raid a little bit closer because, hey, you've got a, a big battle cruiser there to back you up in case things go sideways. Graham W. Kidd asks, what are you going to do about the 300th dry dock? Uh, there will inevitably, of course, have to be a Sparta reference. Um, not sure what else to do about the three with the 300th dry dock. Although, you know, by the time I get to the 300th dry dock, the um, Commemorative Medal and Coin Company that I engage the services of might actually have completed the I Survive the Dry Dock medals. You never know. Uh, Way Into Adventures is a new signed poster print of Thunderchild. That's not a bad shout either, actually. I do actually have a fully coloured 3D, 3D model of Thunderchild now that I could potentially turn into a new Thunderchild poster. Hmm... That's not a bad idea. Of course, I'd either have to learn the uh, skills to actually take the 3D coloured model and have it as anything but just suspended in free space. But maybe I can engage somebody. If anyone's any good at turning at uh, taking a 3D model and just adding, you know, background and foreground stuff to make it into 3D art, maybe drop me a line. Um, HMS4 says you could explain the opening video clips from the five minute guides. I've done that actually. I did that for the previous celebration. There was actually the competition of basically getting people to work out which ships were which and what was happening. And then I announced the winner on a dry dock ages ago. Um, Stephen Richard says, did you ever get rid of your big aircraft mod carrier model? Uh, that is actually going south to uh, I'm donating it to Pompey Pals, Pompey Pals, um, uh, Royal Navy Veterans Organization and Club down in Portsmouth. Mm. Right. Uh, way into adventures. Yep, Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors is fantastic. Um, the audiobook version on Audible is actually also quite good, uh, which is remarkable. For some reason, um, a lot of... The, the, I mean, there's not a huge, huge number of good naval history books on Audible. There's a, a decent, solid number of decent, solid books. But for some reason, whoever the publishers are seem to be a little bit hit and miss in selecting readers. Um, and that's the one, that's the thing some, um, 
that's one I need to get back to somebody who asked me via email, I think. Um, the the problem with with um, get getting naval history books on Audible, if you prefer listening to stuff like that, is that it's not just the content. You've also got to be able to put up with listening to that particular reader's style of style of reading and voice for 12, 18, 20 hours. And yeah, I admit there are one or two books which I've struggled through because, you know, two hours in, I'm just like, I don't want to hear this person say another word. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Knight 6831 asks, would a York version of a 9.2 inch armed 15,000 to 18,000 ton cruiser be bigger or smaller? So one with six guns in three twin turrets. Uh, a six gun 9.2 inch cruiser. I mean, I think you could you you could probably get it in for le less than fifteen thousand tons. I mean, it depends if you're doing it. Okay, so it's a treaty violating cruiser, but if you're doing it in the treaty era where maybe you had a ten thousand ton hull ready to go, I think you probably might just be able to fit three twin nine point twos on a some one of the larger ten thousand ton type hulls. You wouldn't have the armor to repel nine point two inch fire. But yeah, I mean, if, if you wanted to expand the ship to include armor against your own guns, then yeah, maybe you might be pushing 15,000 tons, but you, you it would definitely be on the lower end of that. 18,000 tons would be, I think, yeah, yes, at that point, you'd be looking at either three triples or four twins and a lot of AA firepower. Ooh, wow, there's... um. That's a bit of a jump, right. The Stoned Abbot asks, how do you rate the painting of Thunderchild on the cover of H.G. Wells's, oh, sorry, of J. Wayne's War of the Worlds? I mean, it's a nice picture. Um, I like the tripod. <sighs> you know, everything about it is good. The only... The only downside is that it falls into the fairly generic trap that a lot of people do portraying that particular event of just portraying Thunderchild as a generic pre-dreadnought. Um, other than that, it, it, it's good. Um, of course, I'd love to have that kind of thing, but with the proper Thunderchild in it. But um, yeah, for some reason, I, I did actually put a down payment for the, the artist who did the first illustration of Thunderchild, I did actually put a down payment down quite a few years ago for a further illustration, but then they just stopped responding to my messages, um, which is a bit unfortunate, but there's not a lot I can do about that. Um, yeah. Do, 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 do. HMS Ford says, I think Victory's port broadside could hit the Mary Rose building. Yes, yeah, so that's not at sea, though. I mean, to be honest, if you fired HMS Victory's port broadside, you'd be hard pressed not to hit the Mary Rose building. Um, Kevin Kenley says, Did Zebex fight on the Nile or just on the open ocean? Um, they could fight on the Nile, at least when the Nile's at its uh, flooding stage. I'm not aware particularly of, of ocean going Zebec frigates fighting on the Nile, but then again, there wasn't a lot of, you know, active warship fighting on the Nile in the era of Zebec frigates. So, uh, yeah. Luna Weasel says, what does your engineer self think about USS Texas's safety versus hurricanes if left in Galveston? Entirely depends on the mooring position. You know, um, and also, well, the strength of the hurricane probably also factors in a bit as well. But, you know, if 
if you look at something like, say, Alabama, coffer dammed in relatively sheltered waters, um, that's one thing, whereas just openly moored on the exposed coast is a very different thing as well. Um, the Stone Dabbit says Almirante Grau from the Peruvian Navy was the last big gun warship to commission in 2016. Yes, um, but I think the I think the gist of the question was more about um, where they said no no missiles specifically. I think it was like when was the last all big gun warship in service that hadn't been refitted or modernized with missiles at that point. Um, Ramal says since the end of your era of videos and topic spans until the 1950 would you end up doing a video about the 1950 korean war such as the Incheon landings or the role of naval ships in korea yeah the korean war pretty much is the cutoff so at some point i'll probably do a video about the naval aspects of the korean war but it's not to be honest massively high on my priority list Megascrow asks, what about the Australia medals? Um, they're in the same boat. It's basically the same company, um, which previously did you know, really good work. Um, they had some supply issues and then they had their Christmas rush. And so, yeah, I'm, st I'm still chasing them every couple of weeks. There is progress. You know, I have been sent um, samples, uh, sample pictures and so forth. So I'm hoping in the next couple of months certainly well actually before easter that's probably around about easter time i'm hoping the the dry dock medals and the australia medal and challenge coins etc will finally be here which will be great because that means for those of you who very kindly um backed the ship shape tour of australia um as i think i mentioned in a dry dock the main reason we haven't been able to send out some of the rewards is because there's some of you are international and if we if i send out you know 50 60 100 plus medals and or, or books now that will be one lot of shipping and then if i send out 50 60 100 plus medals or challenge coins you know 2 3 months later that's a huge cost of shipping um <laughs> And we initially we were kind of working on the basis of well, we've got all the books and all the other stuff ready to go. We're just waiting on the coins and we're still flipping waiting on the coins. Um but hopefully not for too much longer. Um ooh, Stun Duck says the reader makes all the difference for audiobooks. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, there's a reason that Jonathan Giebel has become almost the default voice of most Warhammer 40k audiobooks, especially for the Horus Heresy series. Um, the Bobman says all good history audiobooks should be read by Brian Blessed. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, he actually has done a number of books on Audible that I bought pretty much sight unseen mostly because hey it's like eight out of ten hours per book of listening to brian blessed so yeah <laughs> um um Luna, we right. Okay, so any quick questions that anyone has about the US trip? Probably time to get them in because I think I'm going to wrap things up pretty soon since it's now twenty past eleven UK time. Um, Luna Weasel says, "Is the river low enough for you to go underneath USS Kid?" I'm pretty sure the river is low enough for me to see under USS Kid, but I'm also pretty sure I don't want to sink into ma massive amounts of glutinous mud. <laughs> so, yeah. Graham W. Kidd says Bob Ch Bob Chanel is doing amazing work putting Red Storm Rising in audio form with a great matching computer-generated imagery. Okay, cool. 
Uh, that's that's actually if you can get a good range of voice actors for it, Red Storm Rising would be a really good audio book. Um, <laughs> um, Sean Riley says, "What's this trip named?" I'm not sure yet. Um, Uh, kid isn't well kid is temporarily closing later this year to go into dry dock kids not closing closing as a museum but she is going into dry dock hopefully at some point later this year <laughs> sean riley says do you plan on seeing uss cairo or cairo uh it's kind of on the way from baton rouge to pensacola unfortunately as i say i'm really strapped for time so it's gonna, i'm just going to be going point a to point b um so yeah there, there's lots of places I need to revisit um, because there's stuff in and around them that I didn't get to see the first time round. But we shall have to see. The um, legacy says, "Why is one of your trip dates classified?" And um, yeah, that as as was mentioned for earlier on, that's basically because I'm I'm visiting USNI Press that day, which is on the grounds of Annapolis, which means general public can't get in. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Joris Amelan, uh, where is it gone? Uh, Joyce Amelan, the Graham kid says the channel is Bob Chanel, B O B C H A N E L is where the Red Storm Rising audio thing is. Um, John Thomas, have you visited USS Alabama? Um, yes, I have. There is, in fact, a video about it <laughs> from my US April 2022 trip. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, so, um, just for those of you who are interested in coming to say hi at any of the advertised points and hopefully in the next 24 to 48 hours i'll be able to update what i'm doing the 16th through 19th as well um if you are interested in coming and saying hi at some point um obviously you know, you'll you'll be able to visit a museum or museum ship so that's all good um uh, but for the majority of them from the majority of the ships, the meetups will be around 2 p.m., the official meetups, um, and I'll be updating the community post and Discord with exactly where, because obviously some of it will be a little bit dependent on weather and so forth. Um, obviously, you know, please come aboard and tour the museum ship or the museum before that, but if you happen to spot me on the ship before 2 p.m., I will probably be filming. Um, so I would appreciate some discretion in that matter so that I can get the filming done, which then means I can give, you know, a couple of hours uh, from 2 p.m. till closing to everybody. Obviously, I'm not opposed to just saying hi, etc. while we're passing, but if I'm filming, I do need to keep up that schedule. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be a bit short of stuff. Um, with USS New Jersey, that's very slightly different. Um, okay, apparently people are saying the channel is now called Fixed It um, for the Breadstorm Rising thing. Um, for New Jersey, it's slightly different. So on New Jersey, uh, there's a special ticketed event on New Jersey where both Ryan and I will be giving very specific presentations. So you basically you get to hear uh, content from both Ryan and I that isn't on either Battleship New Jersey channel or my channel. So that's the, that's the sort of executive special draw, if you like. Um, there will be a general meet and greet later in the day before the ship closes, um, but that will be somewhat abbreviated, obviously, due to the fact that, firstly, we'll be doing the presentation side of things in the early afternoon, and also by the fact that I need to get from Battleship New Jersey to Dulles in under five hours. <laughs> um, 
which going around the DC Beltway apparently makes that ambitious, but if I don't make that journey, I won't get home. Um, <laughs> because that's the evening of my flight out. Uh, reading Railroad Fan, any plans to visit USS Cod? Yes, again, this September. Um, Matthew Escalante, plans to visit U505 in Chicago? Uh, did that last year. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, Cod is on my list for September this year. So. In September, there's the Historical Naval Ships Association um, conference. So I nowadays basically always try and plan a sort of two, two, two and a half week visit to the US around that. So um, Charleston's on my list. Cod is on the list. Uh, I'm adding a few others as well as, as time goes on. Um, Uh, the Legacy, do you have a brief update on the USS New Jersey, Sullivan's, and Texas when it comes to the major restoration projects? Um, I do know something about it, but um, obviously Texas and New Jersey, they have their own channels, um, Facebook and YouTube, etc. So what they choose to reveal and when they choose to reveal it is that's their call. So... I'm not going to break any confidentiality on that. <laughs> I value my relationships. And also, to be honest, like, you know, people like, uh, you know, Libby and Ryan and Travis on New Jersey, New Jersey and Texas, respectively, are actually, uh, they're genuinely nice people and my friends. So if they tell me something, I'm going to keep that to myself until it, they decide it's time for the general public to know. Uh, for the Sullivans, um, I do need to get back in contact with them to talk about you know how they're doing they are doing a pretty they are pressing on pretty well with their restoration projects i actually have a whole ton of footage from like um what was it be about about two three months after she went down so just uh, just after she'd been brought back up and the first stage of cleaning had been done i need to put do, do a video based on that footage in the next few months um because obviously it's now almost a year almost almost two years since i actually was there um but it is still very interesting footage and hopefully it will inspire people to go and say hi to the sullivans a little bit more <laughs> um nathan d says in previous dry docks you've mentioned wanting to do various experiments such as gel balls Oh yeah, the um, gelet pellets um, and ship corrosion, cordite, etc. Have you been able to make any headway on those? Cordite experiments, not so much. They're, you need to have very specific licenses to play with that stuff in the UK. Um, but in terms of various types of preservation techniques for ship corrosion, I do actually have a small ongoing experiment in the conservatory. Uh, I just have to top it up the water levels every couple of weeks. Um, but I'm running that for like a year and a half already, so we'll see how that goes. Um, do, 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 do. Right, so... I think... I think I'm pretty much going to wrap it up there. Mark Bass is going to get the last question. What's the abandoned ship near the freeway going down to Portsmouth? Um, I think that's probably... Well, it depends which one, because there's a, there's a, a small commercial ship that seems to just sit on the mudflats. I don't know what that is. There's what's left of poor old HMS Bristol, the Type 82, in the northern part of the Navy docks. And then out across the water, there's a couple of Type 23s awaiting disposal. Um, yeah, the Royal Navy's disposal of of the its old frigates and so forth really irritates me because an awful lot of the uh, disposal notices that come out explicitly say for scrapping only. 
which is like, yeah, there goes my plan to dig a massive hole in the side of a riverbank after having bought a couple of acres of a riverbank land and just sail a frigate or similar into it and then fill it all in and then have an instant house. You know, I would love to do it, but apparently the Royal Navy exists in their, at least in their disposal arm, to frustrate my plans by only selling X warships for disposal. And apparently there are legal consequences if you don't dispose of the ship in a scrapyard. If they could just sell them generally on the open market, that would be so much better because I want to, well, who wouldn't want to live in a, you know, former warship turned house? Not technically a houseboat at that point because it, it would be permanently docked on land, but there you go. Um, right, so. Um, yeah, that, I'm going to wrap that up there. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, coming to see what's going on in this particular first dry dock of the year. And I hope to see a bunch of you, hopefully, over in the US in the next few weeks. So uh, see you all then and see you again in another video or on another live stream, whichever happens to come first. Bye.